you want, would like to make a comment on anything on the agenda tonight, um, you may do so by taking a speaker card in the back, writing the agenda item, and giving that to Eva, who's on the end here at the table. If you need translation services tonight, we have our translator. She's sitting over here on this side of the, the room, and she'll be happy to set you up with translation. Somebody should probably say that in Spanish. Do you want to say that in Spanish? Eva, would you be able to say that as regarding translation in Spanish, please? Um, solo queríamos informarles que si ocupa um, servicios de traducción, la señora Urania um, uh, está ahí atrás, puede ayudarle con um, eso y um, proporcionarle un aparato. Thank you, Emma. Um, next up, we have our superintendent, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, giving comments. Yeah, thank you so much. So, Celeste is going to help me. Um, so every every month we have the the wonderful opportunity to um, go recognize employees of the month, and so we went ahead and and did that this past um, just yesterday. Um, so the first one was Freddy um, Villafuerte, who is our lead custodian at Ansoldo. He's been with the district for over 20 years, doing fantastic work, um, and he told me yesterday, told all of us that this is only the second time that he has been recognized in his 20-some years, and so he was really taken aback. Freddie takes such great care of Ansel, though, and we're, we're fortunate to have him. Um, then for certificated staff, we went and um, we were able to do it with all the kindergartners around. Um, so Jason Zor, who's a teacher at Starlight Elementary, was recognized for the fantastic work that he has been doing with his kindergartners, um, really taking on SIPs, taking taking on other programs and um, supporting our students. So we're excited to recognize Jason. And then she's actually in the room as well um, for our administrator of the month. Um, we went and recognized um, Katie Powell, who's our director of transportation. Um, so I'm sure people know, but we have been down bus drivers. And so Katie talking about taking on extra work um, has been a dispatcher almost every single day this year. And so not only doing her own work, but also um, taking on dispatch work so that um, her, her dispatchers could be bus drivers for our students. And so um, thanks to all the employees of the month, and um, we look forward to continuing to recognize them. Um, then the next, um, you'll see we're going to be um, sending this out on Friday. Um, we are going to be distributing once again antigen tests to all of our students and staff so that they can return ooh, a little bit big. Um, so they have the opportunity to test twice um, prior to returning to school or work. Um, and so they'll, they this time because the as the state gave them to us on time. Um, we won't have to have the them picking them up after the fact. We're going to be able to do this, and this is not the right version. Um, so, Alicia, just so you know, this isn't the right version that was sent out. It doesn't have any of the changes on it. So it's not the right version. Um, so don't take a screenshot of it because I see some of the things are not right on it. Um, but um, we're, we, the, we will be sending them out to the sites on um, this coming Friday. We're picking them up tomorrow. So Rich Adiano is great in having his guys pick them up tomorrow. We'll get them up to the sites on Friday and Monday, and then on Wednesday, all the sites sites will be passing them out. We're asking people, it's highly recommended, not required, which is one of the changes that we're, that is actually on this sheet and that's not on there. Um, and we'll be asking them to test on Friday, April 8th, and then test again on Sunday, April 10th. Um, and um, we're looking forward to a safe return um, to school, and this will be one way that it will help us get there. Um, so thanks so much. Oh, and one last Thanks, sorry. Um, I just want to also recognize um, um, Brian Sexton and Allison Nizawa for their work on recruiting. So the board, through their um, their support of the stipend, has it's been very successful. We've already now every day we keep um, hiring more and more. So we're now at over 25. Um, 
the contracts for next year that we have already filled, and um, usually we're we're barely doing any um, until April. And so, thanks so much for that work, and we're going to get filled. Next, we have uh, governing board comments, and we're going to start on the right side of the table with um, Trustee Dodge Jr. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Everybody watching at home. Everybody here. Uh, I just wanted to briefly say that I attended two meetings of the girls squad um, organization. Um, they're still accepting prom dresses or bridesmaid dresses for the special ed prom that they're having coming up soon. So if anybody has any you know, extra prom dresses or bridesmaids dresses, they could be dropped off at uh, Church of the Nazareth, I believe, 710 Green Valley Road. Um, I also just want to say that I also attended the safety committee meeting um, last week. Uh, I, I heard there was an uh, um, evacuation event here at the towers, and so some of the workers were kind of looking to have a little bit better understanding of the evacuation process here at the towers. Um, and I, I just also would like to say thank you to Watsonville High School Campus Security Carlos Rivas. I'm pretty sure people saw that, you know, there was an incident in Watsonville High where Carlos, the campus security, he saw that somebody had a gun. Um, he immediately reached out to SRO officer CJ where he was able to immediately call Watson PD and they were able to take care of the situation. So I'd just like to say thank you, Carlos, and uh, SR officer, CJ. And uh, finally, I was able to attend the Watsonville City Council meeting last night where Watsonville Mayor Ari Parker and the rest of the City Council honored uh, the Watsonville High School boys soccer team and it, it was a great event. You know, it's good to, to always recognize champions. You know, I, I'm proud and honored to have gone to Watsonville. You know, Watsonville High School soccer has always, you know, brought home the CCS championship. And like I mentioned before, you know, we might not have the, the best equipment, the, you know, we don't recruit, you know, we don't, we don't do scholarships, but we always have some of the best teams in the state. And I just uh, like to say thank you, Mary Ari Parker, Watsonville City Council. I, and I told her, <laughs> Coach H, Roland, just one more year, you know, we, you know we're, we're trying to do the best that we can to fix the stadium and we, you know, we want him to be around and bring another CCS championship. So thank you very much. Go Cats. Um, I'm going to yield my time for comments. We have a really packed agenda tonight, so I'll yield that time. Thanks. Thank you. Trustee Shocker. Thank you, President DeSerpa. Thank you, everyone, for attending tonight and those watching. Um, I attended the Parho Valley Education Foundation meeting, and we'll have some updates coming up soon, but we have lots of fun events um, planned. Um, I also attended our Migrant Head Start Policy Committee meeting. Um, was able to um, attend with Trustee Holm legislative action meetings um, with Senator Laird and Assemblymember Mark Stone. Um, we discussed the need for um, increasing our local controlled funding, and we also discussed the need um, to change our ADA, which many districts have declining re enrollment in the current process. Um, is not working. And we also talked about supporting transportation bill for the state to pay for transportation for students. Um, also attended the Intergovernmental Committee um, with the City of Watsonville and County Supervisors. Um, I know there's been some questions on what's going on at, with the bridge um, at Parho Valley. The part of the pedestrian bridge will happen. The other part of the um, br bridge that we're trying to work with, we still need permission from the landowners in order to have an easement so that students can safely um, get to school. So that is something that is still being worked on. 
Um, have a wellness committee meeting coming up next week, so I'll give you information on that. Um, I'd also like to personally thank Mr. Singh, um, who owns a &I Transport, for his um, donation to the Starlight Emerald Glassy Kitchen. I was able to meet him when he came to check out the garden project, um, which is going to be amazing. So keep um, looking for news on that and looking for a post on that. And if you know anyone who wants to donate to a worthwhile cause, we are still accepting donations. Um, Girl Squad was able to raise money for Watsonville High Boy Soccer Rings. So the boys will also be getting their championship rings. Rings have already been ordered. And I'm continuing site visits over the next two weeks. So thank you. Trustee Orozco. Sure. Thank you for joining us tonight. So we've been really busy with the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation. So this is the official invitation that will be going out. Uh, we do uh, have a seat de date, so it will be May 13 at 6 p.m. at the City of Watsonville Community Room. Our keynote speaker is Senator John Laird, and we will be honoring a um, PBUSD community hero. So we're in the process of finding, finalizing details for that, but we will be announcing the recipient of our first annual uh, PBUSD Community uh, Hero Award, uh, hopefully in the next week or so. So we're very excited. Uh, so please join us and save the date. Uh, the proceeds will be going straight back to the classroom supporting student initiatives, student programs, and so forth. Um, it's gonna be a really uh, fun night. Uh, we're gonna have different wineries uh, present along with uh, delicious food uh, from our Watsonville community. So make sure to uh, join us that night. Along with that, um, we have finalized a date for our Pajaro Valley Education Foundation 5K race and that will be um, October 30th. Uh, it will be, uh, we're still finding the, de the details as far, uh, as far as the course uh, goes and so forth. Um, but please save the date, October 30th, and it will be a superhero theme. We want to make sure that it's uh, very inviting. We want our families and um, their kids to participate and so forth, so please join us. And then lastly, the Innovator of the Year Award. So we're in planning process for that. Uh, it will be held on Tuesday, May 31st at the Mellow Center. Um, so nomination forms will be sent to our administrators and um, after that, uh, our team, board of directors will meet and select um, our top 10 to be recognized as a district-wide innovator of the year. Uh, so please uh, make sure that you save those dates. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Oscar Soto, Trustee Soto. Good evening everybody. Uh, Thank you for attending tonight and those viewing this evening. Um, I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Trustee Holm. All right, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, like uh, Trustee Shocker said, um, she and I met with uh, Senator John Laird and Assembly Member Mark Stone, talked a lot about the local control funding formula. Um, and you know some of the other issues that that she mentioned, but you know just in, in talking about how, in spite of generous one-time funding we've received, that's often restricted to very specific uh, purposes, and the chronic underfunding of our public school system continues to impact our options uh, for addressing the full needs of our students, our families, staff, and the community. Um, I also attended the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation meeting, but I think you give a good summary of those discussions already. And then finally, I attended the Special Education Community Advisory Committee, which um, covered a, a couple of really you know, great topics for you know, our families. One on our twice exceptional students, those who I, you know, are identified as gifted, but also have additional you know, learning differences such as dyslexia or ADHD. And we also heard a presentation on the transition partnership a program to help our, our special education students transition from school to employment. So a lot of good resources for, for our family and the community. Thank you. And um, this last couple of weeks, I attended the Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance Board meeting. Um, a lot of wonderful things happening there. I also attended the Safety Committee, which 
um, goes over everything about safety that comes in through the district with a fine tooth comb with multidisciplinary people there at the meeting. So that was really super interesting. Um, I want to congratulate all of our senior class who might be applying for and receiving their admittances to um, colleges, to four-year schools. It's a very, very exciting time um, for all of you, and so I'm crossing my fingers that you get into your top picks. I also want to congratulate all of our student athletes, not just the ones who are, who are winning, but all of the students that participate. It's such an important um, life-building, life-affirming thing to, to participate in athletics. So thanks to all the student athletes across the district and all the coaches. And next we have item 3.5, high school student board rep representatives. We have Diamond Technology, I think, here tonight, or at least a video. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Superintendent Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. My name is Adriana Jimenez Espinosa, and I am excited to catch up on everything we have been doing since February. Our quarter four education theme is ambition, a strong desire to achieve something. We have the top 10 results for the World Series of Innovation Challenge, and Diamond Tech has put Watsonville on the map again for WSI. We received two top 10 finalist results. Our Frosh Techie James Rich is a top 10 finalist for the Maxar Community Resilience Space Challenge. His proposal is to launch satellites over agricultural areas to determine moisture in soil for better farming. Our soft top 10 finalist is Jacob Kiefer, and his proposal is to rebuild housing in Somalia using sustainable materials and existing structures we look forward to hearing the final results sometime in April. Diamond Techies are currently undergoing job shadowing with their mentors. Here's a small clip of how our white tigers feel about their experiences. What I have gained from the mentor program was more insight on my job I want to do and when I grow up. Um, I gained a lot of insight about the legal system and the judicial system, how things work, and lawyers, and court process, and I just think that was a really good experience. I see this as a crucial part of my education because I'm learning a lot of new things with my mentor, and I'm getting a lot of, I'm getting a lot of tips on how I should progress and do what I want to do. Um, like, I have the option for a trade school, which I didn't even know I could do. My mentor, Alan Sneck, 3D designs heart pumps for patients. This can be to what I want to go into the future because if I need to work on some car in the future or electrical engineering, I may need to 3D design parts. So it would be nice to know how to use CAD designing. Um, the mentorship program is kind of like um, just like the opportunity to meet and be guided by someone who is in the same field that you're trying to like get into. Um, I think it's really helpful and it provides a lot of information that you would otherwise not know just by Googling it. So I think, I think the, mentoring, the mentorship program is really helpful. If you have the opportunity to attend Your Future is Our Business Luncheon, you would have seen our techies presenting their e-portfolios and rubbing elbows with prominent business leaders in Santa Cruz County. In fact, our class of 2023 created a video that was showcased during the luncheon and received a $2,000 award for their project. The luck of the Irish is definitely on our side at Diamond Tech. Students enjoyed a wide variety of activities and events for the occasion during our St. Patty's Spirit Week. There are a lot of exciting activities coming at Diamond Tech in the next two months, and we are looking forward to sharing them with you. Our traditional La Pulga will be coming up on May 7th. This will be another amazing event. Please mark your calendars to attend, or even better, scan this QR code on a screen and reserve your 12 by 12 space today and sell, sell, sell. It's only $20 per space. Call Diamond Tech for more information. We have our annual business board competition coming up May 5th. 
If you have ever wanted to be a judge on something like Shark Tank, this is your chance. Come and hear the pitches and decide who gets the scholarships provided by the Santa Cruz Community Credit Union. The Industry Ideas and Innovation Challenge has been released. We would like to encourage any PVUSD leaders and students to participate with us. If you would like to know more about this challenge, please visit foundationforinnovation.org. Have a great spring break. We are looking forward to all of the adventures coming up after the break. And don't forget to follow us on social media. And thank you again for the opportunity to share what we have been doing at Diamond Tech. That was a great presentation. It makes me want to go back to high school and go to Diamond Tech <laughs> and do it over again. That was great. OK, we have another video. Um, do we have new school? Uh, yeah, new schools queued up. Mm -hmm. Oh, is New School here? Oh, come on up. Sorry about that. And then make sure you introduce yourself. It's just Anthony today. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Anthony Godinez. Um, good evening, esteemed board members, Superintendent Rodriguez, and audience. My name is Anthony Godinez. I am a senior at New School, and thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, our theme for this school year is Restore because we were gone from in-person learning for almost a year and a half. We wanted to share our COVID update from New School. Uh, as a school, we are happy that all the mask mandates have been lifted, and we are still taking every precaution we can to keep our staff and students safe. We are also still testing at school twice a week, and um, students and staff have the option to wear their mask or not. We all support each other with our decisions to wear masks or not either way. Uh, we just completed our WASC visit. Our WASC visitation group came to our school February 28th, March 1st, and March 2nd. The members visited classrooms, interviewed students, observed teachers, and studied all that we do at New School. Their presentation about their findings during their visit was glowing. It was attended by staff, students, parents, and partner stakeholders, stakeholders from Digital Nest, Student Success Project, and Environmental Science Workshop. Our basketball team um, season ended last week. It was a dramatic season full of ups and downs, injuries and triumphs, but most of all, we never gave up. We learned a lot about basketball, and most importantly, we all had fun. This week, we started preparing for our soccer season with the Monterey Bay Alternative Schools Athletic League, and we are looking forward to our first soccer season since the pandemic canceled both 2020 and 2021 seasons. This quarter, we are starting our spring outdoor school and character development program. And our theme for the school program is watershed and ocean science. On the first Thursday after spring break, we will be going on different field trips every Thursday to explore local water resources and work with community members to explore career paths. Um, day one, we'll be going um, doing team building kickoff exercises at Going Up Wild. Day two, we'll be canoeing in Elkhorn Slough and whale watching in Monterey Bay. Day three, we're going to go to Carbonated Sea Labs and Self-Guided Aquarium Tour. Day four, uh, canoes and Elkhorn again. Day fifth, we're going to do a beach cleanup. Day six is the end of the program celebration. And day seven is the incentive trip, which will take place in Alcatraz. Our science classes are bringing our garden back to life. Uh, we recently started working at our um, Louis LaFortune Memorial Garden this week, and there's a lot of progress going on. Uh, state testing has started at New School. Uh, we had three days of LPAG testing. The speaking part was completed in February, and the other parts were completed the week of March 7th. Our goal is to have 90% of New School students complete the test. 16 students needed to test, and next up is a CASP te testing. New quarter, new students. This week, we started the new quarter, and 13 students transferred. 11 from Watsonville High School, one from Santa Cruz County Office of Education, and one from Pajaro Valley High School. Having new students is a great opportunity for them to recover their credits and graduate. The new students are coming to get back on track. New students are adjusting to new expectations and the school site. Thank you again for your time and attention. My name is Anthony Godinez. I am a New School Community Day senior. Um, New School Community Day hopes that you guys have a bright and sunny spring break. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Anthony. That was a great presentation, and we were glad you were here in person. It's so nice to see you. Um, next, do we have anybody here from PVHS or a video? Okay. Hello, my name is Fatima and I'm the Social Activities Commissioner for Pajaro Valley High School. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez and the fellow board members. I hope all of you had a good weekend. Now for the academics, what we have done is Ms. Rodriguez took 30 of her students to the De Young Museum to see the art of the Americans and the African Americans. After that, she also took them to the Golden Gate Bridge, which for many, it was their first time being in San Francisco. Then she took them to Pier 39 to eat and have some free time. Now for physics, what the students have been doing is they've been building roller coasters, and then they're gonna test the potential Connecticut energy for those roller coasters. Apart from that, they're also making a website to go with the roller coasters. I'm moving on to our spring sports. Starting with track, they've had a good season so far. They're at full swing with their fourth meet happening Wednesday at 3.30 in Watsonville High School. Now with baseball, they've been doing pretty good. We have 20 guys on the team and they're starting to play league. For boys volleyball, they're starting league also, and they're having their first game on Wednesday at Soledad. Then for softball, the girls are doing pretty good. They've lost their first games, but they're looking forward to actually having a good season and winning. Now for our activities here at PV, we did a tropical dance for our VIP students, those being the mod to serve students. They had lots of fun and they all enjoyed it. Then we're gonna have a night in the quad. The kids are going to be able to roller skate and just have fun and watch a movie afterwards. We're also having our first club carnival of the year. And then we're also having a book swap. So the kids could come drop off their books and then they're, they're going to be able to get a new one. Thank you. Thank you, Pajaro Valley High School. That was great. Um, and finally, I think we have Watsonville High here. Herman is here in person. Thank you for coming. Is it gonna, is the clicker gonna work on? All right, that's totally fine. Hello. Hope y'all are doing good. <laughs> awesome, we ready? Awesome, so once again, and as always, hello everybody. My name is Herman Rafael Gonzalez, representative of Watsonville High School. First, to give you all an update about how things have been at Watsonville High School in the past month since I've given an update, I'm gonna be talking quite a bit about our athletics, primarily about our boys soccer team. So as you all likely remember from last month, boys soccer won CCS and the images are a bit messed up on the transfer to Microsoft Word, but you can see that boys soccer actually won the regional and state semifinals game. It was for everyone that was there, and I don't know how many of you were there, it was an <laughs> incredibly intense game with Watson High School winning 7-6 on penalty kicks, which was just insane. Uh, boys soccer also played against the first place seed, Whitney High School, which was actually ranked eighth nationally, and Watson High School also ranked uh, in the top 100 soccer teams nationally as well. And despite Whitney High School being all the way past Sacramento, we almost had a full crowd in the stands with so many families and friends coming all the way to Whitney High School, all the way past Sacramento, to come and support our boys soccer team. So that was massive. Talking more about that, all of our teams from this spring season, it feels like there's more than any season. I'm not exactly sure if there is, but it feels like it. Our swim team, our lacrosse team, our track and field team, our baseball and softball team have begun practicing and competing. And I wanna give a shout out to two members from our track and field team, our sophomore, Eli Romero, and our other sophomore, Giancarlo Mendo, because they got second and third place for their prospective events at our Invitational last Saturday, I believe. So we have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of promising students, both in cross country and in track and field, so look out for them next year. Talking a bit more about what's going on at Watsonville High School and the things that we have uh, planned, 
Watson High School is planning to recognize April as it is National Sexual Assault Awareness Month, which is in the month of April. We're currently attempting to contact Monarch Services for a possible panelists or resources for our student. And so we're really trying for April to demonstrate how Watson High School is a supportive community, and we really hope that we can recognize this month to show that, to show to our survivors that there's a community, a place, and resources for them, which is very important to us. Alongside that, Teen Mental Health Awareness Week was celebrated last week and recognized last week. Uh, we celebrated and uh, recognized it by hosting an egg hunt that had positive affirmations and directions to our wellness center where over 100 students were given information about the mental health resources that we have on campus, not only our mental health information about our mental health clinician, but also our social emotional counselor, Ms. Medina. And Honestly, I think this is a really good uh, awareness campaign. We got tons and tons and tons of people visiting the wellness center. It was practically full almost every day, and it was just really, really, really impressive. Watson High School also celebrated National Down Syndrome Day with a food day sale. So we had clubs from all over Watson High School participate in this food day sale. And notably, Watson High School's junior avid class raised over $250 for Ukrainian refugees by selling sunflowers to students and faculty alike. So that was really impressive, and we always have this really impressiveness and really impressive activism coming out of Watsonville High School. Some fun stuff coming up, Watsonville High School's Spring Fling Dance. So unfortunately, due to the spike in COVID that happened in February, uh, Watsonville High School missed out on our annual Royal Hearts Dance. However, we're going to celebrate instead with a Spring Fling Dance that's happening this Friday. Tickets are $10 each and will include banda. So that's always really, really, really exciting. And Taco El Jerry will be the awesome um, uh, awesome local business that we'll be hosting there. And he has a special Wildcats plate that's gonna be for $5, so we're hoping to keep their stomachs full and keep their feet moving. On April 12th, Watsonville High School will be hosting our first open house of the school year. We had a virtual event at the beginning of the year, but we're glad to be back in person, especially with the lower COVID numbers. Uh, we'll be closing down Lincoln Street, and we'll be offering that space to our clubs and possibly local businesses that wish to sell to our families. So we're just very excited for our families and parents and siblings and everyone to be able to come visit Watsonville High School and meet our teachers. An update on prom. Prom tickets are on sale. Tickets are $100. Watson High School's prom is always particularly expensive, but that's for good reason. Including the ticket is transportation, a full meal, taquero, banda, photo shoot, DJ, and souvenir. So it's always a massive, massive, massive night where everyone's always moving. Miss Grants always tells us that everyone just gets <laughs> gets their money worth. Like if we're closing down at 11 p.m., we have people dancing at 10:57 p.m. just begging for another song. And so Watson High School's prom is always massive, and so we're super super happy to be able to be hosting it this year at the Cressetti Hall. Watson High School also hosted the No Hate Tour, BMX anti-bullying program. So they joined us during the during class during fourth and sixth period and hosted a rally in the new gym. They delivered both anti-bullying messages alongside an amazing performance and you have some of our ASB helpers up there with some of the tour members. Giving a massive shout out to some of our notable students and some of our notable helpers around campus, Watsonville High School Student Union Club is helping out across campus. Every single Wednesday they've been a part of the beautification of our campus and also the well-being of our campus by cleaning up both the quad, um, the geyser field, I don't know if you've seen the um, how you say, the bleachers and the stands during games, but a lot of trash ends up making its way down there. And so Watsonville High School Student Union has dedicated itself to going under there and cleaning out, keeping safety in mind, and keeping our campus in mind as well. Watsonville High School Student Union has also been involved and uh, has also started a sort of beautification campaign to get more students to respect our bathrooms, which is one of the things that I'm here to speak about. Uh, they're trying to improve the state of our bathrooms because oftentimes uh, it's very quick for us to run out of toilet paper, soap, paper towels, which especially in a pandemic is something that's been a massive concern for really all of us. Some of the necessary improvements that we have in our bathrooms are taking quite a bit of time. In the quad bathroom, the boys' bathroom in the quad, um, one, of the stall, one of the stalls is actually missing a door, and that's been 
not great. No one's been able to use that for uh, almost the entire year, so that's something very notable. Uh, alongside that, a lock in the gender-neutral bathroom in the cafeteria has been broken for a long time. And so not only keeping in mind the safety and well-being of our gender non-conforming students, but also just the cleanliness of the bathroom and the gender-neutral bathroom, it's been really important. So the question that I have for y'all to keep in mind and keep um, keep with you after this meeting is what is the district doing to ensure that there's a quick turnaround for necessary materials because that door was ordered in 2020 and it needs to get here very soon and so we're just hoping that uh, we can get that support at the district level to keep our bathrooms cleaner and if not I imagine a lot of people have a lot to say so let's hope it goes well thank you so much for your time thank you Armand great presentation and I know our superintendent will help fix the problems with the bathrooms. Next, we're going to move on to our agenda. And staff tonight has made a request to pull one of the items, uh, item 9.14. So I'm looking for a motion to I'll approve move. the agenda minus 9.14. I will move to approve the agenda minus item 9.14. A second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries um, 7 0. Um, next, after that, is the approval of our minutes from our last board meeting on March 9th, 2022. I'll move to approve. I'll second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone, um, anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion passes unanimously, thank you. Item 6.1, I'm gonna open a public hearing on our um, public disclosure of collective bargaining agreement between PVUSD and PVFT. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, and public who are here for the public hearing. This AB 1200 process is required by Ed Code, and anytime we do a settlement with either of our unions, we are uh, under the direction of Ed Code to disclose the cost of that agreement to the public. So that's what the AB 1200 is set up for. Um, thankfully, when we did our second interim, we did include the cost of this agreement in our second interim. So this AB 1200 tonight for you has no budget revisions necessary to be able to afford the agreement. We did send off the um, the AB 1200 to our county office on March 10th, and I would like to just do a quick thank you to Leanne Reyes and Rebecca Olker at the county office who were able to get a quick turnaround for us and allow us to bring it to this board meeting. They did confirm that we are able, based on our second interim, to afford the ongoing increase. The total cost of the agreement comes out to be a roughly 5.9 million. That's for uh, the 21-22 school year settlement. I would like to note that it, during this um, settlement, we did speak with board, we did look at our budget. We are utilizing one-time funds only for the increase in the current year. For the out years, as we do not ever recommend using one-time funds for ongoing increases, we are relying on a um, anticipated increase to ADA to afford those and actually improve the status of our budget going forward. That ADA um, increase has been proposed in the January proposed budget by the governor and all signs right now are pointing to we will see some sort of ADA proposal in his May revise. At this time, I don't have anything else for the board. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Um, do we have any public speakers to this item? Uh, we do not. Okay, any questions or comments from our board members? No, okay. And with that, we'll close our public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Is he next? <laughs> it's Al, okay. I'm gonna reopen a public hearing uh, this is item 6.2 California School Employees Association chapter 132 sunshine proposal for the 2021 2022 2022 2023 and 20 <laughs> sorry 2023 and 2024 school years to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District excuse me I got a little tongue-tied there no you're not right. I don't have to do it thank you President De Serpa. Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So tonight we have, and, and the public, the public hearing for the Sunshine Proposal. So 
This is the Sunshine proposal to the district from CSEA. We are in a full contract reopen, so this isn't a, just a reopener. We are looking at a contract for the next three years. So CSEA um, is interested in sunshining the recognition article, leaves, holidays, health and welfare benefits, pay and allowances, bilingual, and I believe the bottom one is just the reopeners and the terms of the agreement. So um, that is what they're bringing forward. And so if you have any questions, I can answer those. Are there any public speakers to this item? We have none. Okay, are there any questions from our board? Okay, thank you, Allison. Mm -hmm. I'll, close the I'll close the public hearing now. Thank you for presenting that. Mm -hmm. you have another oh, one. you're next, okay. <laughs> I have another one. Okay, this will be the last public yeah. hearing tonight. Um, this is item 6.3, PVUSD Sunshine Proposal to California School Employee Association, or CSEA, Chapter 132 for the 21-22, 22-23, and 23-24 school year. Yes. Thank you again, uh, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, and, and the public. So the board is in, the board, you're the board. The district <laughs> is intending uh, to also sunshine um, to open up a CSEA for our, the next three years, um, the transportation article. Um, so floaters and bus drivers as well, or driver positions, transportation, and then any related documents that are for the transportation department. Um, so typically we don't both sunshine in the same board meeting, but given the timing of it and we don't have another board meeting for another month, we're, we're doing them both in the same so that we can get to the table and start negotiating with CSEA. So if, there aren't, if you have any questions about our sunshine proposal, please let me know. Do we have any speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, any questions from our board? Uh, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Thank you. Next up is item 7.1, our visitor non-agenda items. Uh, people will have two minutes each to speak on any item that is not already on the agenda. Do we have any speakers? Yes, for this item we have two speakers tonight. So I'm going to call up um, Diane Sampson followed by Chris Webb. Good evening, members of the board, and Dr. Rodriguez, and uh, esteemed guests. Um, I wanted to say that I've been working for the district for 15 years um, with, ten, with sorry, five different schools. I'm always the first teacher to arrive at my school site, and I'm often the first, the last teacher to leave. And over the past five years, I've gotten plant donations at my school that help with engagement for students, and the students get to take home the plants, and we have salvia all around our quad, and we have milkweed growing there so that I can have the monarchs. And so I called the, the um, Santa Cruz Sentinel, and they had the front page with my student and the monarch butterflies this year. It was really great. So we've had some really good things this year. Um, I wanted to say that um, I also come back during the summers to water my garden at Ohlone School. And every day I do a social emotional activity with my second grade students, along with all the academics that we need to do. Um, last year was a really hard year. Uh, I worked um, during the summer school and in the afternoons when th we had one day on and one day off with all those students. Summer school, they didn't have enough teachers so I had 36 children in my classroom, uh, of which about five every day weren't there. So we were rotating desks. It was really crazy. Um, COVID's been really disruptive for all the teachers. And I just wanted to say that it's not quite done because this morning I got a call that another one of my students has COVID. So um, just saying, there's, there's still stuff happening. But there's hope at the end of the tunnel because I get to stay here at um, PVUSD, which I'm so, so happy. And um, this afternoon it was really delightful. We had the banana slug string band in our quad playing for our after school program. And it was like, yay, we're getting back to normal. So I just want to thank the board so much. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Diane. That was a lovely, positive report. We appreciate you. Um, following up on your last meeting and some comments from board president, um, I just want to say I'm the parent of two children under four and someone who resides in the district of a, in, in another district 
But um, I want the board to know that I would be interested in possibly having my children attend PBSD schools. The programs of PBSD interest me at the elementary level, and I would be glad to know how PBSD could serve my children and child care needs, um, and then also uh, how they could support their s Spanish skills. And then would they, would PBSD be able to work around the demands of my schedule as a teacher at Renaissance? Um, part of my willingness to entertain such an idea comes from dissatisfaction with my home district and specifically the way they treat their teachers. They may pay better, but they seem to respect their teachers less and they seem less genuine overall and are definitely less transparent in their operations. Um, that being said, my year this year at my site has me a little worried that P what if PBSD is trending in the same way as that other district. Um, I know the response to our site winning model continuation status, that response being supplanting our, our program for a restorative practice framework was disrespectful to the veteran staff. And in the wake of distance learning, it seemed kind of reckless. When numerous staff left around that time, that should have been a red flag and not a green light to shun best practices. Receiving restorative practice training this year and seeing the full extent of our implementation uh, I can definitively say we had a more restorative uh, site previously, and I'd be more than willing. Um, I mean, one, one clear indicator of that that strikes me is that students used to be more willing to apologize, and we don't get those anymore. We have more outbursts. Um, it's and, and it's also like really hurt our teacher morale. So um, I'd be happy to meet and talk about how we can improve for next year, so, district wide. Thank you. Thank you. Next up we have item 8.1. This is employee organization comments and um, to kick it off is PVFT. Good evening board. So Nelly, I'm gonna, oh. I can't change the two minutes. I'm gonna be putting three minutes on my phone and then. I get five. Right, three and then two. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Aside from just doing five on your phone. Right. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> All right. Um, good evening, board. Uh, I wanna start off by acknowledging that as we approach the end of the year, um, that our educators, the people that we represent, teachers in the classroom, and those who provide the supports outside the classroom, as well as our CSEA brothers and sisters, have worked really, really hard this year. Um, and probably doubly so from our remote year, because <laughs> because of all of the multiple changes that, that we've had to be at the ready to implement. Um, so I, I do wanna just say thank you to our brothers and sisters in the CSEA um, and the management who has stepped up to help fill um, vacancies. Uh, there are so many resolutions on this agenda that um, I'll come up and speak to some of them as they arise. Um, but one that's really important to us, um, they're, they're all important to us, but one that stands out as we are, represent the adult ed um, teachers in our district is that we recognize that the PBUSD has a special privilege of providing adult ed services to the entire county of Santa Cruz. So we have adults all over our county who um, can benefit from the professionalism of our adult ed teachers. And one of the things, one of the areas in which we always advocate for, for, for our adult ed staff is for permanency. That's something that the adult ed program has um, kept from them. So every year that they work, they don't know if they're gonna come back the next semester or the following year, which makes it difficult to create any kind of um, stable connection. Um, one of the arguments for not providing our adult ed staff permanency is that they are too expensive when they have to be provided health benefits. Um, which is very unfortunate when we have a resolution that acknowledges the important work and the important service that they provide to all of our um, communities in the Santa Cruz County. Um, and then I wanna acknowledge um, that our after school program provides a valuable service to um, extending the school day for our students. 
having once been an after school program teacher myself, many of our colleagues, many of our the members that we represent during the academic day, um, extend their work day by um, also contracting to work with the after school program. Um, so our students are receiving continued service um, and guidance in their education from our um, from our members. Uh, there is an item number n under agenda item 9.15, the Sabres. Um, this is a very frustrating item to see on this agenda to ask for your approval for $17,000. I think that's what it was. Um, this is more work. This was never presented to us to have a discussion with our membership. This I learned about through a community, um, a collaboration with community mem com outside community agencies, not in curriculum council. Curriculum council finally had their meeting and it wasn't an agendized item, but it became the thing that suddenly got pushed in. This is not something that should be approved for some, to be mandated for this coming year. Uh, our teachers, again, have been working tirelessly all year long. Our teachers are tuned in with our students, and when they uh, need the services for their student, they do reach out. So this is a, a frivolous use of money for our district um, to expend. And um, it's very upsetting that we do want to collaborate with the district and ensure that our members are being asked to do, if they're going to be asked to do something new, that something else needs to come off that plate because our plates don't grow bigger. So um, this is, if we are going to move forward and work at collaborating with each other, we need to be honest with what is going to be proposed to us and to our educators in the classroom who implement all these programs. Um, and I don't know where I'm at with time, but thank you and um, you'll see me up here again. Thank you, Nellie. Uh, do we have anybody here tonight from CSEA? I saw a couple of CSEA reps in the back. Uh, Esther is here. I saw Esther. And Diane. Uh huh. Do you, you want to come up? Or? I'm no longer an officer, okay. so I'm not. All right. so no, they don't have any. No. no, there is. Oh, there's Richard. Should I say it? This is Richard Martinez on behalf of CSEA. Hi. How's everybody doing? Board of Trustees, how we, how's this go again? Board of Trustees, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, and President, who's up, uh, Kim DeSerpa. Hello. Um, so we have put up our sunshine. Um, like I just got here, so I'm not too sure if I missed anything. Um, hope you approve. Our members are excited. They're ready to go. Um, can't wait to set some dates up. And we're looking forward and seeing how this negotiation goes um, for the most part. Um, yeah, yeah, I wasn't ready right now. I had to try and catch my breath. Um, but we are excited. CSCA has always been there on the front lines trying to do their best and represent this district the best as we can and we are the people behind the curtain but we make things work uh, that's all i got for right now thank you thank you richard is there anyone here tonight from pavam any manager we presenting? do not have a pavam report this evening okay and how about 8.4, CWA, our Communication Workers of America, representing our substitutes. Okay, not here. Uh, next we'll move to our action items. Um, item 9.1 is a resolution, 21, 22, 33, recognizing April 24th through 28th 
as at the after school professionals week. And this item is being delivered by Carol Ortiz. Thank you. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, members of the board. I present to you tonight this resolution proclaiming April 24th to 28th as After School Professionals Week. PBUSD's Extended Learning Department has been offering quality after school and summer programs for over 20 years. Working alongside a wide variety of community partners such as Second Harvest, City of Watsonville, and Santa Cruz Arts Council, just to name a few. Our grant funded programs include tutoring, homework support, art, music, science, and much, much more. The majority of our after school staff are young people who live in our community and attend attended local schools themselves. Their dedication, enthusiasm, and commitment to the students in our community makes me very proud to be part of this team. I respectfully ask the board to approve this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, and are there any comments or questions for Carol from the board? I, uh, Carol, did you want to tell? You can go first. No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought there was no comments, so I was going to make one, but go ahead, Jen. It's okay. I just want to say that, you know, as a board member, this is a great resolution and I support it. I know that um, PVUSD does a lot uh, with their after school program and is even working on extending and doing more. And I think we really tried to go above and beyond during COVID, working with our community mm -hmm. partners and getting at risk students into safe places. Yep. So thank you very much. Thank you, I appreciate that. Just really quick. Uh, Trustee Orozco and then Trustee Holm. Sorry, Jen. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm also in full support of this resolution. I think um, we all recognize uh, the role that after school programs play in students' lives, but also in families. We have families, you know, hardworking families that don't get out of work at 3 p.m. and are unable to pick up their kids from school. So, providing a safe environment where students can continue to learn and uh, explore. Um, and just enhance to a point um, their educational experience here at PUSD, I think is fundamental. Mm -hmm. So thank you and any, everyone involved in making that happen for our families. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee mm -hmm. Holm. And I just wanted to, to add that, you know, I've, I've seen the after school program expand you know, over the years and just the quality of it, you know, improve. And it's, it's been wonderful to see. And what I usually hear from my constituents is, they want more, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. and, and it's asking for more because they're excited about things. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. that's always nice to hear. Good, good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Our after school programs have always held um, a special place in my heart because of the quality, the safety, the creativity that's there. And for many families, like many of the trustees have already said, that have to work, it just is a good place mm -hmm. to leave their kids because it's so enriched. So thank you for. Mm -hmm. um, leading the charge on that and Thank congratulations you. to Thank all you. the professionals working in our after school programs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Trustee Dodge Jr. I didn't see you. I'm also in support of this resolution. You know, Thank you, Carol Ortiz, for what you've done. The after school program, it, it helps our community. You know, a, a, a lot of the people don't always get off right away at three o'clock, you know, three, four, five, six, seven. I went to the after-school program mm -hmm. at uh, Mini White, and it's 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 an important service for you know kids to keep learning. You know, we we, we kept learning. We we worked on projects until our parents came home to pick us up. You know, five five thirty, and start getting dark. So I'm in support of this complete support of this resolution. I just want to say to thank you, but for the decades of the how long the after-school program has been around. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Appreciate the support. Thank you. Okay. Would anyone like to make a motion to we'll make a motion to approve? I'll second. Nine point one. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Anyone abstaining? Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you, Carol. Thank you very much. Item 9.2, Resolution 21 2235, Week of Adult Education, March 28th through April 1st. And this report is provided by Dr. Nancy Bilicich, our director. Hey, good evening. 
President DeSerpa and trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, we are so happy that every year we have Adult Education Week, and it gets us to really focus on the needs of the community. You know that we have our Community Advisory Council that we meet with three to four times a year, and they are so supportive of our programs, and they give us ideas as to what, what we need for our students and our community. So next week we get to celebrate um, Adult Education Week. We have the we provide the um, largest amount of instruction for English language learners and citizenship in the county. Um, you know, and, and we have open enrollment. What that means is that students can come in today. Even though the semester started, they can come in today and they can sign up and they can start right away. I mean, we give them a test, figure out where they're gonna go and put them in a classroom. And our teachers are really extraordinary. They just continue to welcome our students our classified staff is awesome. We couldn't have a better staff. And it's all about community service and how people are greeted and people really like our employees. So um, it's really nice to be able to celebrate them. And then of course, you know, we, um, we work on high school diploma. So if students are behind, they drop by, they, again, open enrollment, they're behind credits, they can get their credits and hopefully complete their high school um, diploma at their schools where they are if they're behind in credits or earn their own high school diploma with adult ed or the GED program. And we really have expanded career technical education, um, especially in the medical fields and we feel really good about that. We have a certified nursing assistant program, we have the clinical medical assistant, we have pharmacy tech, and hopefully soon we wanna have the licensed vocational nursing. And that is um, uh, really, there isn't a program in the county right now. So we're excited, we submitted our papers and it's supposed to be about a three year wait more We've already been at it two years. I think they're gonna talk to us in January, so we're pretty excited that we're early. And um, cosmetology, we're just starting, and we feel good about that, but we wanna add more. We think we'll uh, do much better come fall. The teacher's just starting now, so we think it'll expand. And in April, we start the Green Gardener program, which is, um, they can do landscaping, and people come from all over to do that program. And then our pre-apprentice program, pre-apprenticeships, where they're working on the trades, construction trades. So we're pretty excited, and we're glad to have your support. It's always there. You know, each one of you individually come at various times and say thanks, and, and it makes a difference to the teachers, makes a difference to our classified staff. We've had over 94 years adult education. I'm not quite there, but, <laughs> but we've had it <laughs> for a long time. And uh, so we would uh, respectfully ask you to support this proclamation. Thank you, Dr. Bilicic. Is there, are there any speakers to this item? We do not have any speakers. Uh, okay, and we have a comment from Trustee Dodge Jr. Sorry for talking so much on these resolutions. They, uh, they just mean a lot, you know. Um, I'm not sure how long you've been teaching adult, adult ed but I, I know you eat, breathe, and sleep adult ed. Not I, 94 years, though. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> but I, I, know, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for what you do at adult ed, your staff, you know, um, turning for a job, you know, union jobs. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I remember attending a, a union graduation I just happened to stumble <laughs> across on. But y y your program teaches some of us who don't go to college how to work. And I, I would just like to say thank you and also what, what you do for Wattsville to get people in there. You know, I, I know your love for the city and I know you believe in adult ed and I, I just want to say thank you. And thank so you. I'd like to make a motion to support this agenda item. Okay, so point of order. Um, sorry, Nellie. Sorry. sorry. The speaker card got stuck with the, the others. Uh, but we do have one speaker. Okay, well we have a first. Let's get a second and then we'll ask a second. Speaker. I'll make a second. Okay, thank you. And we have a speaker? We do, Nelly. Good evening. Well, we appreciate um, 
that there is a resolution that is that is um, honoring the work, the hard work of our adult ed teachers. We also just want to put it on public record that our adult ed teachers do not get prep time. So when a student walks into the classroom, that is that that's the hour they're getting paid. So any kind of grading that happens, that's done for free by the adult ed teacher. Um, curriculum that needs to get developed for a class, that's done for free by the adult ed teacher because they are not provided prep time. Um, I do want to say something about this, um, it, the, the wording on uh, the third whereas, because it speaks to um, the adult education recognizing that it breaks the cycle of illiteracy. And, and while that is definitely true, am I reading the correct one, um, the third one, I recognize that to break the cycle of illiteracy, we must focus on educating parents, providing, provide programs in family literacy and English language acquisition to parents who, um, who learn to tutor their children and learn how to navigate through the school system. The, while the intent, um, there is some positivity in the intent, it also comes off as um, like if they're second language learners, that they're illiterate. Um, so I just wanted to point that out in this and so if there was a way to amend that to um, make it sound more pos positive and not that it's implying that people who do not um, read or write English are illiterate. Um, so thank you. Have a great evening. Um, are there any other, Chair yeah, there Trustee was, Acosta? Yeah, so we've... <laughs> okay, so Trustee Judge first, the, um, made the first and I second, and I'm not sure where, you, I think you two are having a dialogue. I don't know if there's any point between um, Dr. Rodriguez or Dr. Vilicic if there is any amendment made. I'm open to that if that ne you want that or need be, or if we're moving forward with it as is. So that was the first point. D did you have any clarification, I, anyone here? Well, so in my point of view, it, it is challenging to do a change on the spot. Um, I always appreciate, um, we post on Monday, so if there's people who would like to have amendments, it's always easier to be able to tell us that prior to this time because when we're doing things on the spot, sometimes um, it's not necessarily the amendment that we wish. Um, we have done it, so it's not that we can't do it. Um, um, so um, it is up to the board if they want to make the shift. I, I mean, I can have Dr. Bilicic speak to it. I, I also will say that we do have um, a subgroup of parents who are um, unable to read or write in any language. We do have that. Um, and so I don't know if that's what this is speaking to. Um, I don't know that I would necessarily say someone, which I think is the point, I don't think someone is necessarily illiterate if they can speak and write in in a, in a language, right? Um, and so I, I guess we can speak to the intent of that, but we do have a subgroup of parents um, because of their um, their educational background, they are not literate um, in any language, which is why you see the videos in, in which I produce. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the reasons is um, so that people can um, hear me um, explain something versus um, have to read it. So yeah, and, and if that's a conversation, then maybe before next year, maybe that conversation could be had ahead of time, because mm -hmm. I imagine we'll be having the resolution again next year, around this time. So, um, so to move on from that, thank you for clarifying on that. Um, I just wanted to um, recognize and commend you, Nancy, for um, and as it was also mentioned earlier, what you and just your whole team in adult ed have done for our county now as a whole, right? Because it was Watsonville, Aptos, adult ed, and then you brought in Santa Cruz when that was gonna, they were just gonna be left, you know, and recognizing that need and embracing that and taking on that. I just really wanted to recognize you and your whole team and what you're doing um, in adult ed for our community as a whole. And, meaning 
in the entirety of Santa Cruz County. So thank you very much. And I'm very happy to support this tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other comments from the board? Oh, Jen Shocker. Thank you. Nancy, I just want to say, um, you know, I've heard from students who have taken place, um, who have done programs with adult ed, how grateful they are. I know our high schools are grateful too. Um, just knowing that students have the option for other things after high school helps um, ease students' minds. So I applaud um, adding the medical programs and I'm excited about the LVN program. And I know that we have some students who are very excited and happily awaiting for that program to start. So I don't anticipate you'll have problems filling that program. So thank you for being innovative in the programs we're bringing here. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Christy Roscoe. <laughs> Thank you. So obviously I'm in full support of this resolution. I thank you um, and your team and our teachers do amazing work um, as far as providing, um, you know, these programs to um, our community here in Watsonville. I think as, you know, as we continue to grow and expand and even be more innovative, um, I, I've been getting a lot of inquiries uh, regarding possibly an HBAC program. Mm. It seems to me that I think the only, the, close, the closest one I think is Gavin Non College. Um, and so that's just to keep in mind. I think it's um, a hot market right now as far as um, jobs go. Mm -hmm. So it'll be something to look into and consider as you continue to expand upon your programs. I appreciate your, uh, your ideas because that's how we decide you know we start listening to people in the community and then we decide what's needed so thank you mm -hmm. so i'm not going to repeat everything everyone else said because i agree with it you know you you know you have our support my support i will say work with a lot of young people in this county and i tell them about the programs that um, are available to them through the adult school and so thank you for continuing to champion that for our whole county thank you okay we have a first and a second like oh, I'm sorry, Trustee Soto. Yeah, I wasn't going to say much on the subject, but uh, it kind of tugged at a heartstring. Uh, as a former instructor myself, I taught green building construction for about three years with CET, and uh, a lot of my students were a lot of second chance uh, uh, folks. Um, to this day, on my commute, I see one of my students working for Bellows Plumbing. Uh, Gosh, his, his name escapes me right now, but <clears throat> I see him on the freeway. He honks at me, um, you know, on the on the way up in the mornings, and I'll catch him in the evening sometimes too. So that's one of my success stories that I've uh, personally seen. Uh, you know, this young man. And he lives in Salinas too, so he come he commutes up here to the Santa Cruz area, uh, working for Bellows. So uh, yeah, this is this is great. It's good to hear that you know that. The trades are uh, a viable class right now because, from what I'm hearing, a lot of my contacts out in the trades they're 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 having a tough time finding labor, skilled labor. You know, right now they need anybody with a pulse, but at the same time, you need somebody who knows what they're doing to move the projects along. So it's good to know that you know we're turning out some good folks that are having some good uh, hard skills. We have one of our teachers working in CET every day, and it's a great program. They're, they've been a partner of ours for a long time. And this pre-apprenticeship program that we're going to have in conjunction with the Workforce Development Board, I, I mean, it's, it's all about the trades. And it's free. We've, we've got worked things out that we can do it free. I mean, it's amazing the opportunities that people can have and take advantage of. But thank you for your comments. Yeah, thank you. I don't know where Sorry. we are. Do we need a vote still? Yep. Yes. Okay. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstained? Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving on to item 9.3. We're approving a resolution 212229, recognizing April as National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month. Good evening. President Serpa, Dr. Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, and PVUSD community. Um, 
Buenas noches. It's my honor to bring forth resolution 21 22 29, which once again recognizes April as National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month. If you'll indulge me, I'll just read a few of the key pieces. Um, Whereas National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month highlights a commitment to ensure educational equity and access, leading these learners to thrive academically and become productive, biliterate, multiliterate global citizens. And whereas National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month recognizes the significant languages and cultural assets that bilingual and multilingual learners bring to our schools, um, I want to shout out that. Um, we have over 12,000 students along with their families in over um, 23 languages within our um, district. Um, and so now, therefore, be it resolved that PVUSD proclaims April 2022 as National Bilingual Multilingual Learner Advocacy Month and continues to strengthen our educational focus and focus on bilingual multilingual learners. Um, and with that, I submit this resolution for your adoption. Thank you, uh, Mr. Berman. Do we have any speakers to this item? We do not. Okay, are there any comments from the board or questions? Jen Shocker, <laughs> Trustee Shocker. Um, I just wanna say thank you for bringing this resolution forward, especially with the strides we're trying to make as a district in bilingual and multilingual education. Um, I think it's important that we support all of our learners and especially sitting on DALAC committee and migrant seasonal head start committees you see the impact that our programs are having on families so thank you very much and i would like to make a motion to approve this resolution i'll second are there any other comments or questions jen holm one of the things that i, I very much appreciate about our district is that you know uh, Bilingual and multilingual learners are, are seen as an asset. You know, when I've attended the, the Seal of Biliteracy events, it's like, uh, you know, having, having grown up in areas where, you know, bilingual education was considered something, it's like, uh, there, there was eye rolling about it. Mm -hmm. And that we celebrate it, I think that's a wonderful thing because it is a wonderful thing. And just that ability to, to speak in other languages it's different thought processes. It's different ways of looking at the world, and I think that's a really beautiful thing. I think for me, um, well, I'm bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and being bilingual is a beautiful thing, right? It just opens new doors. It is an asset, right? You're able to interact with other communities that share different backgrounds. Um, so I think it, it really connects uh, me as an individual, but also our students with uh, the world, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so I'm very much in support of this. Um, so I think I already seconded the motion. Okay, anyone else? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously, thank you. Thank you. Item 9.4, resolution 21, 22, 34, Autism Acceptance Month. This is presented by our Director of Special Ed, Heather Gorman. Good evening, um, President DeSerpa, Vice President Orozco, board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. So, another resolution. <laughs> I'm here tonight to present a resolution to make April Autism Acceptance Month. Last year we presented autism awareness, but we wanna make a change as the words we use matter. I have a question for you. You can answer it in your heads. Are you aware of me? Okay, that's easy. I'm here, I'm speaking. A new question to propose. Do you accept me? That's a little bit different. So I want to read a short passage from a blog written by an autistic woman who goes by Cassian S. Acceptance of autist autistic people, like acceptance of pretty much all people, involves moving past a surface impression. It involves trying to understand us, trying to know who we are, not just what our operating system is. People who accept us 
or at least those who accept me, have made a conscious effort to not just know what I do, but to relate to why I do it. I don't flap my hands to be embarrassing. I flap my hands because I'm happy, usually. So flapping is a good thing. If I'm being unnaturally still and subdued, that isn't good sitting or controlled autistic behavior. It's a sign of being deeply overwhelmed. The more normal appearing actions are known by those who accept and embrace me as not being good things. Accepting is taking into account that not what people do in situations, but what I do, and recognizing that as valid. Acceptance is joining in my oddities instead of condemning them. People who accept us would much rather see us happy and stemming and obviously different than miserably quiet and blending in. Acceptance is about us belonging as we are to the ranks of fully human people. I wish to live in a world where acceptance is not just the goal, but the reality. I want to live in a world where someone like someone taking in the deficit model of awareness is regarded as uncomfortably out of touch and how things should be. This is my world too, and I want it to be filled with people who know that I'm autistic and fantastic. Not that I have autism, and that's a tragedy. In my ideal world, flapping will be just as acceptable as smiling. Earplugs will be normal as sight. AAC devices will be common, and everyone will know how to converse with an AAC user. And that world, neurodiversity, will just be another way that people are unique. And everyone will agree that diversity is part of what makes the world so beautiful. So to share a few points from the resolution, whereas autism spectrum disorder, ASD, affects one in every 45 children in the US, whereas students with ASD grow up to become independent with successful jobs, whereas PVUSD proudly serves the educational, social, emotional, and career pr preparedness needs of over 200 students with ASD age three to 22, I propose that PVUSD Board of Educators or Board of Trustees declares the month of April 2022 Autism Acceptance Month. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Do we have any speakers? Give me one second. We do not have any speakers. Okay. And then do we have questions or comments from the board members? Jen Holm? I was very moved by this resolution and I hope my words can do justice to what I'm feeling about it because it's like moving to awareness, you know, and acceptance, or moving from awareness to acceptance, excuse me. Um, it's a world of difference mm -hmm. because, you know, just having awareness of somebody, it, it's, it's, it's important, but it reminds me of the kind of the, the tolerance model of we'll allow you in the space. Whereas acceptance is, we're in the space together. Yeah. And, you know, so much of fitting in for people who are dealing with different kinds of neurodivergence, the burden falls all on them. And when we move to acceptance, that that's moves towards true inclusion, mm -hmm. you know, where everybody's together. And that, that makes such a, everybody benefits from that. Because ha again, like we talked about, you know, with our, our bilingual and multilingual families, it's like sometimes neurodivergence is another perspective, and sometimes that Im that perspective is so critically important to how our world works. And um, I, I would like to move to approve this resolution. I'll second that motion. Uh, any other comments from the board, Jen Shocker? I just want to say, um, you know, I I hope that everyone one day can think of um, autism as an asset, like we do think that bilingualism is. And we would have a boring world if we were all the same. And having friends who have children with autism and seeing how they're accepted in our community, in our playgroups, in our playground, it just shows the importance of having these children included in regular classrooms. 
and that I am glad that we've moved to including children in regular in regular classrooms so that they can interact with their peers and their peers can have an understanding that mm -hmm. even though we all have our own little idiosyncrasies, we're all the same inside as we want acceptance, we want friendship, we want acknowledgement. So I hope that this is the start of actually acknowledging that we're all different and treating everyone as assets. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And for me, with me, Sorry, Kim. <laughs> you see me, I was scanning both. Of I know. <laughs> Go right ahead. Jumping, that's my name. <laughs> um, I was also very much moved um, by this resolution and by what you just shared. And you know, I often hear, um, you know what, Maria, the world is just not ready for for this, right? And um, and that's unfortunate. You know, because it's it's not just acceptance within the playground, within the classroom. It's also acceptance within families. And so I feel like this this is very powerful when we move from awareness to acceptance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it will mean the world to not only parents but students. And going back to um, being inclusive. Right, and celebrating diversity. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, and thank you to all the educators and the aides and the families. We do, a, I think, a beautiful job um, helping to educate people with autism. So thank you for bringing that program. I don't know if you brought it here, but I know we didn't have a program at one time. So thanks to everybody who's in that it program was a now. Effort. Yeah. Okay, first and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you. 9.5, Resolution 21-2236, support for April as National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Good evening, Board President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, and PVUSD community. I just followed four resolutions that are very specific about the acceptance and the support of our students. And unfortunately, I have the resolution that sometimes needs to point out the pieces that don't happen for our students uh, with the gravity and the awareness of what it really needs to be in this time period. Um, the resolution that I bring forward to you for uh, to declare our support for April is the National Child Abuse Month, recognizes that child safety is the utmost importance to all of us. We believe that child abuse prevention requires a coordinated and comprehensive response by all systems. Tonight you've just heard four particular resolutions right before me that actually do that support and reach out to various areas within our students that need that support and our families needing that support. I would like to read a, a few bullets in acknowledgement and awareness because not all of our families and not all of our students are supported in this area. Whereas, Data fr uh, from the California Child Welfare Indicators Project. It was a collaborative venture between University of California, Berkeley, and California Department of Social Services. Found 391,470 reports of child abuse in 2020. And that was amid concerns in the virtual learning that we were not getting all of those reports. Uh, specific concern to that is even looking at the allegations to give you an idea of what that looked like between 19 and then the 2020 school year. Um, you know, again, California data, but you're looking at for 16 and 17 year olds, that's 47 cases per 1,000. In 1919, it dropped to 39 cases per 1,000 in 2020. We're, we're missing kids in the cracks and in that gap of virtual learning, more now than ever, this resolution is needed to bring awareness and understanding that we need to, to be more aware of these pieces that are going on with our students, to be able to support them and to also bring awareness to us being a collective body as a community. Whereas child abuse and neglect, it is important societal concern that may affect the long-term health and well-being of not only children, but the adults they become. Whereas safe, stable, and nurturing relationships in communities can break the cycle of abuse and maltreatment. And lastly, I will leave you with, whereas everyone has a stake in ensuring that children have access to resources and supports that they need to be safe, healthy, 
and successful. I ask for the board's action on motion. Any speakers to this item? We do not have speakers to this okay. item. Okay, um, any comments from the board? Jen Holm? As a nurse, you know, I've been, I've worked in a lot of different areas from the NICU to pediatrics to, you know, adult, and, and just, I've seen the long-term effects. I've seen how it affects people's health and the choices that they make in life just out of protecting themselves. Um, sometimes leaving home very young to avoid abusive situations and then all of the challenges that leads to. And it closes a lot of doors. And we're all about trying to open them for our students. Um, so thank you for bringing this to us. Okay, any other comments? Thank you, Trustee Holm. I'll move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Item 9.6. This is resolution 212238 to support Senate Bill 878, Road to Success. Yeah, thank you very much. So I get the fortune of being able to present this. Um, so at a previous board meeting, um, Trustee um, Daniel Dodge Jr. requested um, that we have a resolution on this. So then this resolution is particularly important for us because we actually have one of the largest fleets in the area um, led by Katie Powell. Um, so almost 100 buses strong that transports 5,500 students, um, many of whom are not special education students, but are general education students that wouldn't wind up being able to get to school without that transportation. So the reason for the Senate bill is really to ensure that we receive the proper funding formula for it. So for many decades, we haven't been reimbursed the amount that we need to be reimbursed in order to continue that. Um, so the board, I know even during hard times many years ago when you had to discuss cuts, you decided to continue with the transportation costs. We do contribute from general fund almost $7 million, um, which is the reason why um, this bill is coming forward at the Senate level, um, because a lot of school districts have decided to um, remove their transportation and not provide the transportation as a um, safe, safe cost um, measure. Um, specifically, this is also um, meant to be able to help provide additional funding um, to update our fleets, provide competitive salaries, um, really bring up our fleets and our process to national standards. And so um, we know that when kids have transportation to school, it helps improve um, their tardiness, their absenteeism rate, absenteeism rate and also um, there's a safety um, a, a raise of their safety because um, they are no longer um, walking to school but they have safe transport to school and I know my um, green team will love to hear this it also helps um, fight against climate change because instead of um, instead of having um, cars on the road um, we are able to help um, take them to school um, so I ask that you support this this bill so that we can, or this resolution so we can support the bill as a community and hope that it passes so it benefits our students and district. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Do we have any speakers to this item? We do not have okay. any speakers to this item. Any comments from the board or questions? Daniel Dodge, Jr. Thank you, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez and staff for bringing up this resolution today. Uh, I just like to quickly say, bus services is a vital service and lifeline for the children of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. From the, from the Aptos Hills to the mountains of Las Lomas, from the rural areas of Oromas to the heart of Watsonville, our children rely on buses not just to bring us to school, but to make sure we eat breakfast and lunch as well. Anytime has a board has an opportunity to help advocate to make our bus systems better, this is what I believe we're supposed to do. 
So I would like to make a motion to approve this agenda item, and I would urge my colleagues to support this agenda item as well. Thank you. I'll second. Uh, any more comments? Jen Shocker. I just want to say that this is one of the bills we were speaking um, about during legislative action week. And um, if the community wonders what they can do, they can call or email their senators and state assembly and ask them to please support this bill. Um, you know, we've heard many reasons why bus transportation is vital, and I don't think I need to go over that, but I urge everyone to support it. And thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for putting that presentation together. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Okay, we have a first and a second. I'll just make one comment in that we have tried as a district to curtail transportation in the past. It did not work. So we've got to keep our transportation. It would be great to get $7 million back into our general fund. Um, so first, second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion passes seven all. Okay, next up is 9.7, resolution 21, 37 Women's History Month, March of 2022. Yeah, thanks so much. So um, I wanna extend appreciation to Trustee Shocker for um, helping assist me with this um, in finding a resolution that we could then customize and, and make sure and bring forth. So this is for National Women's History Month. Um, I think one thing that we, we really focus on um, within the school district is diversity and recognizing that um, we, whether it is, whether race, class, or ethnic background, Background that we have that we bring great value um, and contribution to our community and to our nation as a whole. So this resolution um, really just builds on just the significant um, portion that women place in the labor force, um, both inside and outside of the home, um, and then their unique role that they play throughout the history. Um, and so we um, hope that you will continue to support American women as they courageously um, support their families and their community and ask that you approve this resolution um, for National Women's History Month. Any speakers to this item? We do not have any speakers. Okay, any comments from the board? Trustee Shocker. Thank you, President DeSerpa. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for helping put this together. Um, I just wanna, highlight the importance of women's history. Um, if we look at our history, even our current history, for every step that women take forward, we get pushed astride back. Um, we can look at recent legislation that's happening in states like Texas and Oklahoma that are trying to um, ban women's health rights. Um, so I think it's important that we recognize all our women pioneers out there. We've fought long and hard to have our place in society for equal pay, equal rights, and we have proved over and over again that we are assets in this world and we should be accepted, right? A lot of our resolutions are about acceptance and assets and acknowledgements and awareness, and um, that's why I wanted this brought forward. So with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve this resolution. I'll second. Uh, all those in favor? Oh, did, sorry. Trustee. No, no, I was going to second. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Abstaining? Motion, it carries uh, seven all. Thank you. Item 9.8, the 2020-2021 financial statement and audit presented by our chief business officer, uh, Clint Rucker. And we've got an auditor, I think, here who's been waiting a long time to help us understand what we're looking at, so. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez, yes. Unfortunately, I do not have a resolution for you. I actually have our 2020-2021 audit, which you do not get to hear me talk about. You're actually gonna hear Joe, Joe Escobar from I Bailey, who is our independent auditor. He will actually be briefing you on the results of our audit. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joe and let him introduce himself and take care of this. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Joe Escobar, I Bailey. 
uh, audit manager. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the board for having me, um, as well as Colleen and Clint for being very supportive in terms of performance of the audit procedures. Um, they're always helpful. We had no disagreements or um, issues in terms of performance of the audit procedures. Um, our audit is broken up into four different sections. We have a audit plan, interim audit, uh, then we have, uh, sorry, and before that we have site testing um, additionally, and then finally our final uh, audit procedures. Um, <clears throat> uh, in performance of our audit, uh, we provide uh, multiple opinions. We have a uh, opinion, which is the governmental, uh, uh, sorry, GAS, governmental auditing standards. We have an opinion based on federal compliance, state compliance, uh, on the financial statements as well. Uh, additionally, we provide a opinion on the Measure L. Um, in regards to those uh, opinions that we provide, they are all uh, unmodified. Um, with the uh, small exception in relation to uh, state compliance. <clears throat> uh, there was a uh, finding related to uh, the school accountability report card um, in which we uh, were unable to uh, provide a opinion uh, given the inability to uh, tie out the facility inspection uh, tool to the SARC. Um, that is not a financial matter. Really, it doesn't necessarily mean that the district was out of compliance. It just means we didn't have the support uh, in order to uh, determine as such. It's a neg negative assertion when you do that. Uh, in regards to the financial statements, um, our opinion was unmodified, um, as well as in terms of federal compliance. With federal compliance, we went ahead and went through um, COVID and a head start. Uh, there was no compliance issues related to the internal controls uh, or the financial statement components and financial aspects of that portion as well. Is that the end of your report? Yes. So there was one finding related to the SARC. Were there any other findings? No. Okay. Um, that's great. Do we have any speakers? We do. We have two speakers under this item. Okay. So we'll have Nelly followed by Radhika. It's 9.9, .9, right? This is 9.8. Uh, I am so sorry. I don't know what's wrong with me tonight. Any speakers for 9.8? <laughs> no, no. No. Okay. Uh, are there any questions from our board <laughs> regarding the audit? No. Um, Make a motion to approve. There's a motion. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Where do you live? Uh, San Jose. San Jose. And you didn't come too far then, but thank you bad. for sitting through. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The beginning of our board meeting. Well. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think we're on item 9.9 .9 next. There you go. This is uh, approval to approve a tentative agreement, salary schedules, and AB 1200 financial impacts of tentative agreement with the Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Just the top one. Cool. And this will be presented by our assistant superintendent for human resources, Allison Nizawa. Yes. Yes, thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm very excited to present the tentative agreement we have with PVFT um, for the reopener year of 2021-2022. Um, we had, um, we were able to reach an agreement in relatively a short amount of time, and so we're happy and proud of that. We worked very collaboratively with, uh, with the um, negotiating team for PVFT. Um, and so this is the tentative agreement for you um, tonight to approve. Um, I, I think we, we really had good discussion at the table in regards to trying to meet and serve all members that, that PVFT represents. Um, and so we were able to put 
four thousand dollars on the salary schedule for the for the K twelve teachers, um, which also includes the the counselors and athletic directors that are a derivative of that salary schedule. Um, for our nurses, psychs, SLPs, and program specialists, um, a two thousand um, dollar per cell with a one with a one thousand one time. Um, and then we were able to make some some adjustments to our our ECE salary schedules, which I know we've heard and talked about, and trying to really increase that initial salary to entice people to come to the district as well as provide an ongoing raise for those that are with us. And so um, we we were able to, I think, address address that as well as a one-time payment and then a 5% for, for adult education. So um, we were able to do all of this um, also without having to touch or or look at uh, health and welfare benefits. So this is just, just salary. Um, so attached to it is all of the salary schedules that reflect this TA. And I know there's also the um, public disclosure, which is attached as well. I don't know where Clint went, but he talked about it in the public hearing. So that's attached as well. That's from the county. Do we have any public speakers? We do. So we have Nellie followed by Radica. Yeah, Radhika. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Good evening, board. Um, we we want to um, acknowledge the short amount of time that it took for us to reach this tentative agreement, but um, also a reminder that this was a reopener. So this was to close out the last year in our um, three-year contract, which um, it, which ends this summer. Uh, so we will be back at the table um, sometime this next year. This is a considerable raise for the, the amount, for the years that we have not received something on the salary schedule. We did start off with asking for the same amount for all of our unit, um, the, our main um, TK-12 counselors and professionals, um, the professional staff, so psychologists, SLPs, school nurses. Uh, and um, so this is what we, um, what we, Agreed on, um, the district was adamant in um, keeping the school psychologist, um, nurses, SLPs, um, their raise separate from our other TK-12 um, and other uh, salary schedules that stem from the TK-12 uh, salary schedule. It still is um, a significant gain for, like I said, um, being that we have not seen something on the salary schedule since I believe it was 2017-18 school year when we went to impasse and had to go through mediation. Um, so this is going to be somewhat helpful to our teachers, uh, our educators that work off of the TK-12 salary schedule, and because um, we, I'm sure you all are aware, of the cost of living in this area and the price of gas. Um, so this, this is going to provide a moment's relief, but um, as we move forward and as we want uh, move forward in negotiations in the upcoming years. Our goal is to ensure that we have certificated teachers for our students um, and that they grow their roots here in our district. Thank you. Thank you. I'll wait for the <laughs> Good evening, President Serpa, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. I didn't know Nellie was going to come up and speak, so now i got to think of something else to say. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I do want to um, thank the district. Uh, I agree with what Allison said, that it was a very collaborative effort this round, um, and we were able to come to a tentative agreement. I think it was maybe six sessions at the table, which is a pretty quick turnaround for um, what we typically do. So we're very thankful for that. It, it was a much needed time period for our membership to see that we could come to an agreement. Um, as we know, this year has been very challenging. But I say it's a step in the right direction because I do want to point out one area of our salary schedules that we represent that is in dire need of improvement. And I've spoken to this before, but that is our child development salary schedules. Um, currently, even with the six percent raise there are ece members who are making 15 cents over minimum wage 
So um, that just to me is unacceptable. I was an ECE teacher. It is a tremendous amount of work and dedication and a really, really, really difficult job. Um, not to mention that those first five years are vital in ensuring success later on in school. So I hope to take that on as we go into our contract master negotiations. Also, if you look at those ECE salary schedules, they top out after like five years and don't make anything else, uh, even at year 40. So some restructuring we'll hope to do there as well. Um, but anyways, yes, we are very thankful. We hope the board approves this tonight so that we can get our membership paid and get these salary schedules up and out and hopefully attract some more certificated staff to our district. Thank you. Thank you, Radhika. Uh, are there any comments or questions um, for Allison and Jen Holm? I just, uh, just a, a comment that I just wanted to say thank you to the um, union leadership. That's okay. And to the district staff um, for, you know, for the collaborative work that you, you did on creating a, an agreement that is before us and I'd be happy to move to approve. I'll second. Comments. Do you have any comments, Trustee Roscoe, to go with that second? Just in full support, and I'm glad it went as smooth as it, as it did. And we just look forward to the next round. Okay, Trustee Shocker. I just want to say, you know, I, I was happy that the district and the union could manage this as quick as they did. And this board as a board as board member i want to say that we recognize how valuable our teachers are especially our early education teachers um you know it's, this shows one of the reasons that restructuring is needed at the state level to help support public education so that we can help support and continue to support our teachers and staff um, as they've been supporting our students throughout the these years so i am um, glad and I fully support this raise and I know um, I will continue to support the district and our teachers. Thank you. And I'll just say something brief in that um, I know that um, negotiating a contract is sometimes a difficult thing and it's stressful for membership and as well for your administration and board and so I'm really pleased that um, we had extra money that we could offer because we do really care about our teachers and staff and we always want to retain and recruit the best possible employees that we can so I want to thank the unions and thank the administration and um, for all the hard work that went into getting this done so we appreciate everybody who came to the table thank you so we have a first and a second all those in favor aye, aye. aye. all those opposed Anybody abstaining? The motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Allison. Thank you. I'm here for a bit. Are you up again? I, I'm here for a bit. <laughs> I'm here for like Sorry. Next four. To no, find, you're fine. Find where I'm, I'm heading next. Okay. You're fine. So the next item is uh, 9.10 California School Employees Association Chapter 132 Sunshine Proposal for the 21, 22, 22, 23, and 23, 24 school year to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Yes, thank you, President of the Serpa Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So before you is the action item to approve the tentative agreement. Sorry, not the tentative agreement, we already did that. Sunshine proposal, it'll hopefully be a set TA pretty soon, but we gotta get negotiated start first. Um, their, their sunshine proposal for CSEA, so um, we reviewed it in the in the public hearing, so I urge the board to please approve their sunshine proposal as presented. Are there any speakers to this item? None. Okay, any comments? Any more comments? We already held a public hearing. Do you have a comment, Trustee yeah. Shocker? Yes, I just want to clarify, Allison, for the public that may be listening, sunshine means that we are ready to open negotiations with our CSEA. And our yes, so once correct? these are both approved, we can, as, um, Richard mentioned in his comments that we can now put dates on the on the table, which is why we're both sunshining in the same board meeting, which isn't typical, but we're doing that so that we can also hopefully get to resolution quickly for their membership. And, and so yes, we'll be setting dates. I don't know if he'll text me tomorrow, but we'll, we'll get them <laughs> on the calendar. Well, here's to a quick negotiation. So I would like to make a move to approve this item. I'll second. Okay, any more comments? 
Any more comments? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Abstaining? Motion is unanimously carried. Thank you. 9.11 PVUSD Sunshine Proposal to California School Employees Association or CSEA Chapter 132 for the 21, 22, 22, 23, and 23, 24 school year. Yes, thank you again, President Serpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So here is the Sunshine Proposal from the district. Um, so again, um, we I request that you approve this item so that we can begin negotiations with, with CSEA. Are there any speakers? No. Are there any further questions from the board? I'll move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, this is item 9.12, approval of a memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and PVFT for the 21-22 summer school pay rates. Yes, thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So we worked with PVFT on this MOU that's presented in front of you tonight. Um, we anticipate, we, as we've heard, you know, this, this year coming back fully in person from COVID, it's, it's been a lot. Um, and we need to, to continue through the summer. And so we wanna be able to offer some incentives in order for teachers to continue with us in the summer and, and wanna teach summer school. With the expanded learning opportunity program funds that we are receiving, um, it's gonna help support the program as well as um, expanding the days for students as well as the hours. And so we have a couple things happening in this MOU, one of them being a signing bonus. So it's something we've never done before, but we're trying to recruit and attract people to the summer school program. Um, so there's a $1,000 signing bonus there once they, if they complete the, the whole summer school. Um, we are wanting to continue with doing per diem pay for summer school. Typically it's been supplemental rate, which is a much less amount. We'll be paying the teachers per diem as well as in order to provide the before and after school hours um, kind of required by the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, we are um, increasing that hourly rate to $70, where it is currently $33.81. It's a little bit more now because we're just approved the TA, but it's, it's around that dollar amount. And so we really wanna incentivize um, teachers to, to um, do summer school as well as try to also address what, everything else with the cost of living, gas, and all those things, so enticing them that way. So I request that you please approve this MOU tonight. Are there any speakers? Give me one second. Um, we do not have any, actually, No, we don't have any speakers to this item. Okay, are there any comments or questions um, from the board on this item? I'd like to make a motion to approve. I'll second. Um, I have one question. What is, by, when you say in number two, the daily per diem rate, mm -hmm. what is the daily per diem rate? So it's individual based on your salary. So like my okay. annual salary gets divided by the days I work and, and that's what my daily rate is. So Got it's it. essentially your daily rate, whereas the supplemental rate is based off of step one, column one, which is the, the first step. So basically whatever you earn currently as a teacher right now during the regular program is what you'll earn to teach summer school, where typically it's been the supplemental rate, which is the 33 and change depending on the year and what our salary schedule is. And under number three, where it says teachers who choose to work additional hours providing instruction will be paid $70 per hour. Correct. Is so, that on top of their per diem rate? Yes. So the oh. se the per diem rate is for a seven and a half hour workday because that is what they currently are, are teachers work at their uh -huh. seven and a half hour day. So if we want it, we want to be able to provide that time before before mm -hmm. school and then the time afterwards. And so in order to pay that, we usually use supplemental rate. We're asking to increase that supplemental rate for that time to seventy dollars an hour in order to, again, because we're having such a hard time recruiting. It's just yeah. to entice and 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 yeah. help. Um, get teachers to, to do the program. So well, we want to sounds be, great and I like the thousand dollar signing bonus. Yeah, That's really trying to be creative. fantastic. Yeah. Okay. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstaining? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Uh, next is uh, item 9.13, approve the pay rates um, for the 21-22 summer school principal position. Yes, this is the last one for me. So thank you, President DeServer, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So in the same vein as also trying to recruit administrators to run these programs, um, we have a, a, pay, a different pay rate for you tonight. Um, so these are based off of the principal salary schedules. Um, and so 529 a day for elementary principals, 545 for middle school, and then a 578. Um, for high school with a few additional days just because of the transcripting and the, a little bit of extra work that the high school principals will have to be um, required to do. Um, currently, our summer school stipends have been 5,000 for middle and elementary and 75 um, for high school. So this would be um, a little bit of an increase, um, again, to, to um, help recruit and entice principals to take on the work in the summer. Okay, do we have any speakers to this item? None. Okay, any comments or questions from the board? A question. Uh huh. Do you feel that we're going to have principals that are going to be willing to do this? So it can be a site administrator, so it doesn't necessarily okay. have to be a principal. It can also be an AP, people with, with admin credentials. So we've had it in the past with, okay. at their per diem rate. So yes, this is for those that maybe aren't at the principal level. It is an enticement, and we've always been able to fill them. So yeah, I think this will help. Just okay. as we had for the other item. So we don't need a signing bonus for them. <laughs> so uh, it's a little bit of a, a tricky situation. Yes, a little bit more just management versus um, bargaining units are just a little bit different in terms of salaries and, and signing bonuses and such. Thank you, Allison. Mm -hmm. I'll move to approve. We have a first, a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next up is item 9.15, approval of Fastbridge contract or Please. Sabres social, academic, and emotional behavior risk screener K through second. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Tonight, I'm here to present on the social, academic, and emotional risk screener known as SABERS, and to also request your approval um, for a possible pilot to scale um, implementation and approval of the contract with FastBridge. So as you know, the social, emotional, and mental well-being of our students has been a priority for PVUSD and stakeholders, even more so since the pandemic. And so with Sabres, it is a universal screener. So we're thinking, why Sabres? It's a universal screener that not only approaches um, screening our students, um, and looking at the negative indicators that we need to help and, and, and prevent and support, but also the indicators of resilience and well-being that we also want to highlight also at the same time. And so as we're looking at this, um, it will also help us to be able to find the right intervention and support at the right time so we're not having to wait until later. And I will show you a little bit more so as we look at Sabres, it is actually a questionnaire that the teacher takes, right? For, and we will be utilizing it with our K2 students. And so the teacher would be taking it, so it wouldn't be taking up class time. And they would be filling out, it has um, 19 items um, that they would be using our Illuminate system to um, to record their responses. And how it works, it's broken up into three total domains. You have the social behavior, the academic behavior, and the emotional behavior. And so this is quite unique because it has the academic behavior piece, which actually focuses on um, attentional issues that a student may have so we can actually prevent them from struggling and having a behavioral problem. Or it also finds and identifies that they have academic um, indicators of success, things that we want to, to replicate and support 
um, and expand on. It also, when we're looking at the social behavior, you'll see that it's split up into externalizing problems. So those are the problems that teachers see or administrators see or parents see that are that are very visible, right? Like arguing or acting out or being disruptive. But then when you look over, and, and so it will link it to social skills and interventions or the specific appropriate support that a student may need with an issue like that. And then we have the emotional behavior piece, which are those internalizing problems that we often don't notice for quite a bit of time when students have the anxiety or they're worrying or they're withdrawn and sometimes we're noticing those way later on they come out. And so this is a, a reliable and, and highly valid um, screener that will tell us um, and will show us the, the at risk factor for the, for the students and again what their strengths are. So as you can see, it's 19 items and it's broken down. This, the social behavior component has six items, the academic six and then seven um, for the emotional behavior. As, as we know, we have social emotional counselors, we have other supports like check in and check out. This will help us save time and save the teacher's time also because instead of trying to be send a student that may not need social emotional counseling, right? They need social skills instruction and opportunities to practice with their peers, very specific. Um, we will be able to identify that and help them from the start as opposed to trying to put them in an intervention that we may have that may not be um, productive for them because it's not what their need is. Um, and so as we're looking at that, that will help free up some of our resources. It will also help us identify classes that sometimes are imbalanced, right? Sometimes we have a class that may have more students that have a certain issue or not, and it makes it challenging for the teacher too. We had some of those because this last year coming back because our students weren't in classrooms and our teachers um, usually help with, with um, designing classrooms, right? They have class cards and they help balance them out. This was um, a challenge this, this time, even though they did it, because they had them online, right? And so, so the behaviors that you, can, that you exhibit online are different than the ones in person. Um, and so this, why we're trying it at this time in the year too, is because it will actually help us <laughs> Um, with, the, with the younger students, um, give them an opportunity to use this to help balance out classrooms and needs and um, support our teachers and our students at the beginning of next year too. So as you can see, this is a, a summarized approach to again those three domains as you're trying to better understand them. The social piece again are those social norms, being able to empathize, um, being able to look at other people's and understand um, their perspectives and care about them. <laughs> um, and then that academic behavior piece um, that will actually help our kids to prepare and par prepare them to participate and engage and focus in a classroom um, situation and for academic instruction. And then our third one again is that emotional behavioral piece, right, which helps us um, see how our students' ability to regulate, right, their behavior and to also how they're responding and adapting to change and stressful events, right, which we know are really important to help them um, be able to cope through, th through challenging times. So as we're looking at this, um, it takes on average um, a minute and a half to do a, um, to complete a student screener, um, and it can take between one and three minutes at the high point. Um, again, we're using our Illuminate um, system, so it will make it really easy to get the results, and it's a system that we're already using, and then it's linked to. Um, direct curricular supports, right? So it'll, it'll give you prescriptive social skills groups or different types of interventions that we can do or preventions, right? So we want to be preventative too or knowing a strength, we can actually tap into a student's strength and it will help us um, support a challenging area too. So because we do value um, collaboration with our, our teachers and we know it's really um, important and critical to um, the education of our students, right? Um, we are conducting a, a pilot with six of our schools 
um, this spring. And so the students, w- uh, not the students, the teachers will have the ability, even though those are the pilot schools, we have heard th- that we want to give that choice for them to opt out or opt in, right? Um, it's that opt out option. So we will provide the time during a restructured Wednesday. We want to make sure that we are providing the time, um, not during a prep session, Um and give them that opportunity at those six sites. With that said, I have had some teachers reach out to me that are not part of the pilot that want to be there at a school that's not too. So we have been hearing that that um, too. So we want to be able to honor um, those staff members also to to check it out. Um, and again, why we why are we using this because it's so practical and so quick right we don't want to take something that's going to take away from instructional time it's very practical it's also highly reliable and valid that means it's been used over and over again in different demographics and populations and it's tried and true and similar results right and then high impact so it's that practical approach and then hopefully it will help our system Um, and our classrooms be able to serve our students quicker, right? And take that heavy lift off of our teachers too so they're not filling out um, something twice or or trying to um, get them a support that they might not need. Um, And then with that said, this is really important because as we're thinking again about why Sabres, this will help us offshoot also what, what has been proven to be true too, is when compared to office discipline referrals that happen outside, right, a lot of the time, research has shown that Sabres is three times less likely to identify students of color as having behavioral problems, which is so important for us to be able to, to have another um, assessment to help us stop that, right? and provide that equity. So this is um, giving us another approach that is more equitable to make sure our students are successful early on. Um, So with that said, um, staff is requesting approval for the contract with FastBridge. Are there any speakers? Um, Yes, we have one. Um, Nellie? Good evening. Money is always a discussion between the PBFT and PBUSD when we're negotiating. $17,000 might seem a pittance for this district, but it's a lot. That could actually go to an enriching uh, field trip. Teachers, kindergarten, think about kindergarten students filling out a survey like Sound to Grow. Uh, first grade and second grade, those teachers in those classrooms are, again, working tirelessly. The whole, we'll have them do it on a Wednesday, on a short day, that came about because I asked some questions when I learned about this at a non-teacher collaboration. Um, Our teachers get to know our students. We work with them in small groups. These are primary grades, we work with them in small groups. In those small groups, we learn their social and academic behaviors. We learn about their emotional needs. We don't need to fill out a form. Every spring around this time, teachers begin to get their cards or the cards for placement filled out. We call it a card party, and that happens usually in May, in which Teachers from various grade levels get together and they have conversations about the students as they create their next year upcoming class. And we, in those cards, we provide data, important data that addresses the emotional need, the academic need, and the social need for those students. That's also found in the QM. So our teachers don't need another task and our district doesn't need to spend $17,000 on this. Instead, invest $17,000 in a field trip. Thanks. Thank you. So I think Dr. Rodriguez has a comment. Yeah, thanks. 
So I just want to make just a couple of clarifying statements. So one, we do do sown to grow, but we don't do sown to grow at K2. Um, so we don't actually have an assessment which allows us to know our social emotional needs of our students. One thing that we know is early intervention is the most important for our students. And one way we can do that is through quantitative data that we can't always do with gut reaction. Um, I was a first grade teacher for many years and so I will say I knew my students well, but I didn't necessarily always look at my students through these lenses, which I think is important. Also just a second point is the pilot itself is $3,500. Um, and so we do have the opportunity if the pilot was to go significantly poorly, we do have the ability by January 1st to not um, fund the second portion of this. Um, I do think that um, it is important for us to know um, what our students can do so that then we can build off of those assets. And so um, this is an opportunity for us to be able to find out how long does it really take our teachers, how much um, impact does it really have through this pilot. We have done pilot to scale throughout this district and um, been very successful. And so I'm asking that the board um, continue with this pilot as well. Casey, did you have anything else to present? Okay, are there any questions from the board? Yep. Mm -hmm. Trustee Dodge? Well, I was listening to this and seeing the schools that were up on that list. How were these schools chosen and why are these schools chosen? Yes. Why were these schools chosen? So there were several factors taken and we always want to get a cross section of our district, right? So we're looking at making sure that we're getting north zone schools and south zone schools. We're also looking at sites that are have certain programs going on because we want to make sure that we're not overloading. And then we also are looking at um, assets at that school, the programs that are supporting something like this, like some, some additional interests of teachers or programs where they really are doing um, work like additional work around SEL and behavioral supports. Second question is, so in other words, when we have these teachers do their screening, are they guessing what these, if these children have social emotional problems? Is it? No, it is having, it's a questionnaire. So it's asking how frequently something has occurred or that they've seen in the last month. So then they're, they're creating a record of, of a survey. Yes, it's, it's, it's turning it into data, which will help focus in, um, the supports and uh, measures. And so where does this data go? Where does this data go? It's housed in our Illuminate system that we have, um, our learning management system. And so it, it provides the data just like we have all of our other data in there too from other assessments. And then where's that data going to? It is housed here, and our teachers get to use it to make um, to to make um, decisions and to be able to support them with their students. And how long does the district have that data for? I would have to get back to you on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just kind of unsettling. Well, well to me, um, we're creating you know these records of guessing. You know, oh, I think he might have a social emotional issue or because then you know it's up to the teacher no so it's if i if i yeah. can respond thank you um trustee dodge so it's it's actually not guessing they're answering the questions and so it's not the teacher's not prescribing or saying they have an issue they're just being asked if they have seen these these behaviors and how frequent so it's a Rikert scale, a likert scale but weren't they doing that already, like on a report card? No, we don't have something like this that that turns. No, but I'm just you know, you know, the teacher might say, "Hey, you know, I notice your son or daughter at a certain time, you know, isn't feeling well or just not responding." Because you know, I I went to these schools and I remember when they handwritten report cards, um, they they would say little things like, 
you know, sometimes he has a hard time sitting down or he's having a hard time reading. You know, I don't know, it's just, it's just kind of unsettling, you know, rec you know, records and data and storage and. So our, our Illuminate system records and keeps track. That's why we have our, our FERPA agreements and laws that we have to follow to secure that information. Thank you. Trustee Shocker. Thanks, Casey. Um, so basically what you're saying is how this works is the teachers are given a standard set of questions for the system that they fill out. So they are provided a questionnaire that they're filling out from each student that is provided by the SABERS, correct? Correct. So it's not the teachers coming up with a questionnaire, it's a provided questionnaire. Okay, and it's about one and a half minutes per student to fill out, um, is this some, how often are they expected to fill this survey out? So for the pilot, it's just once this spring. Um, as we expand, what we have, what has been recommended is um, you would do it at most three times a year, but two is highly effective. So the two um, screening windows that has, have been recommended to us would be uh, between four and six weeks. So in fall, after school has started and, and we've had the students in the classroom, and then you would, um, you would follow that in a winter time screening. So teachers would not be expected to use their prep time. You're saying this would be something that you would do on a restructured day for teachers that are following the program? Absolutely. Are we in a current pilot right now with this program? No, we would be, we would be starting it. So this is for starting for the fall, for August? No, this would be in spring. So it would be starting this spring. So why wouldn't we wait to see how the pilot goes before we moved on this item. So why wouldn't we wait to see how it goes, get a report in August, and then move forward? Great question. So we would want to, this gives us an opportunity because we have had so many, uh, we've had so much, so many ramifications, right, of the pandemic and kids and students coming back to us. So we want to be able to, hey, get a jump start, right? We want to be able to also try out, even though we've had the recommendation, like if we've only done it twice, what would be the best window um, to be able to do it also at the end of the year and help with the building of those students and make sure that we're balancing out, we're able to get out those the rest of the kinks and, and get the feedback from the teachers also and see how valuable um, the information and the impact again is. Okay. I'm gonna say I'm just a little skeptical on that this only happens twice a year when you know teachers are taking daily notes. Typically, I know most teachers take daily notes on what's going on with their children, communicate with, pa with parents through parent-teacher conferences, report cards, phone calls. So I, um, just a little skeptical about this. We used to have a program called Kid Power that dealt with social emotional learning um, in younger grades where it was actually an active um, program. Do we know what ever happened to that? No, but I would be happy to check out and see what, how long ago, that was before my time. It was before your time. <laughs> yes, it was before your time, I'll, I'll give you that. It was just seems to me that, yes, we need some kind of social emotional learning and help, um, especially if the pandemic, I don't necessarily know if this is the right program for us. So um, in my opinion, we'd be better to do the pilot for the 3,500, have a report, and then move on to decide if this is something we wanted to expand. Um, but that's just my opinion. So thank you for taking the time and putting this report together, Casey. So if I, if I can just make a note. So the program that we use now for social emotional learning at the elementary level is Sanford Harmony. So we're not assuming that this is the program. This is the assessment that then helps us provide the interventions to the students. So that's why it's called a universal screener. That's why it's it's so infrequently um, used because it's not meant to be something like um, sown to grow, which is more informative. So this is more to um, check to see if there is possible needs that we can then address using intervention. So I just wanted to note um, this is this isn't something that would replace our Sanford Harmony. 
Okay, do we have any other comments? Okay, can we start with um, Trustee Soto? Is that okay? Yeah, I just want to piggyback off, to, off of Trustee Dodge's comments. So essentially, you're filling out a form, asking questions as they relate to each individual, correct? Yes, Okay, correct. so essentially we're profiling that child in a sense, correct? You're putting that, you're answering on a Likert scale. Well, essentially that's what we're doing because we're identifying certain characteristics about a certain individual as they pertain to everyone uh, separately. Secondly, that statement up there, three times less likely to identify students of color. That's irrelevant. Whether the kid is yellow, blue, paisley, it, it shouldn't matter. And statements like that are the reason why that issue survives. Um, and I don't agree with that. I, I don't think it has any significance. It's irrelevant. It shouldn't matter. Um, and the fact that we're collecting data and identifying individuals and profiling them, and we know what that statement means in recent history. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in agreement with Trustee Dodge, it's kind of alarming. Trustee Holm. I'd like to offer my perspective uh, as somebody who uses screening questionnaires frequently in healthcare. Um, they're a very valuable tool in identifying, you know, things. It's not a profile. Like I do a postpartum depression screening questionnaire on patients. And it provides a standardized way to, you know, assess, you know, the needs of my patient. And it provides me with information and just, you know, it's like, yes, I know my patients. I, I, it doesn't mean I'm not a good nurse but it provides me a structured way so that we can communicate team member to team member about the needs of our patients. Um, it's not profiling, it's about identification. Um, so I'm a little, well, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but I wanted to just circle back. I, we've had your assurances that teachers are not required to participate, correct? Correct. If, and you said it's it's just gonna be done once this semester? Once this school year. It'll okay, if, if year. for example, a teacher um, had, had agreed and then they're like, you know what? I said I would participate, I am overwhelmed, I cannot participate at that time, could they opt out? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, you, and Dr. Rodriguez, you already answered my question if the pilot doesn't go well. So we already have a structure in place if we don't like how it's going. Will we have a, a report back if, you know, if? if sure, we can, we can make that happen, no okay. problem. All right. <laughs> I, I, I think that was my Academy Awards uh, music cue, so I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay. Um. Trustee Rosco, do you have something? Yeah, I think the only um, comment I would like to add is that in order to determine what supports a student needs, we need an assessment in place. And so we can't not be guessing when it comes to students, especially we truly want to support them in any way possible. Um, so for that reason, I will be supporting this tonight. I also disagree that this is not profiling a student. Um, yeah. I'm just, uh... thank you. Um, so I have a question about intervention because in like uh, Trustee Hall, I work in healthcare and I've worked in social services mo all of my life, 30 years. And we have a lot of training kind of um, supplied to us about how to assess and identify issues and problems, but not a lot of training about intervention, right? So you assess, you identify, then what? And in our district for many years, because we were so short budgeted, we didn't have the interventions in place to help kids that well. So even our special ed teams, kids would wait for a very, very long time for assessments, for interventions, et cetera. And sometimes parents would have to even put it in writing to get their kids tested, et cetera. 
So I'm wondering now, we're, we have all this, this great program that potentially could identify kids that need help, then what will we do once they're identified? Well, I think it's depending on what their what their need is identified for, right? So what need is identified. So if they are a student that would identified um, for a, <laughs> I'm gonna go back to, I'm a visual person, um, back to a social behavioral need for an, ex, um, an externalizing issue, then they would probably, depending on what, um, the, the program is, is directing us towards, it would tell us a specific social skill and we would be using the curriculum to be able to support that. So it may be, it may be a social emotional counselor, it may be um, a, a person on campus that, is, that has decided they wanted to be the social emotional support, right? So it's just, it may be a psychologist, it's just depending on what that need is. If it's, uh, it may be an academic piece where we can just be a put a preventative measure in place and it's just knowing before it even happens that this student has trouble focusing and may need a daily schedule, provide a visual schedule in front of them as a reminder to stay on task or whatever it may be. So it, I guess it just depends what that need comes out to. The, the SAVERS program will actually um, direct us towards a uh, feasible intervention or support for them. So teachers are going to be expected for 20 or more kids in their classroom to come up with an individualized plan based on this screening for each one of those kids plus referrals? No, what it would... Okay. No, that's... Well, that's, I, I, that's yeah, why no, I'm asking no, questions, no. right? Yeah, so no, it would identify students that really are most at need, right? And it's also identifying strengths to build off of also, so you're getting to know your students better. So it's really making sure that we're troubleshooting and getting them the right support. So we're not sending maybe a student that, that is an internalized, it has internalizing issues to um, uh, a check-in and check-out when they really need to see a social emotional counselor, mm -hmm. right? Because what happens is sometimes we're sending everybody to one intervention instead of it actually dividing it up and saying, oh, this is, they're, they're exhibiting these, or they have this ranking, they're gonna need this type of support instead of another. Okay, I get it. I always- But thank uh, you for articulating, like, so uh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, I, I appreciate how, um, Trustee Holm brought up the piece about the, the medical field, right? So I always equate it to like a, a, when you go into the dentist, right? So this is kind of like that, the x-ray, the screening, the everybody should be getting that, um, that, that it's screening. It's an assessment, right? right. The assessment. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're not gonna go and try to drill a cavity when they don't have a cavity and they have something else over in their gums and they need something else mm -hmm. instead of that. Yeah, okay. Um, I understand you're trying to help kids mitigate risk and early intervention. Like, I understand that, and I, I do support doing a pilot. Um, but I will say, just to address Tristy Soto's comments, institutionalized racism in schools is incredibly well documented. Kids are expelled at higher rates when they have brown or black skin. Kids are placed into special ed over the years when they have black, brown or black skin. It is w a well-documented fact. So I actually liked the statement here that says that kids aren't over um, identified that are kids of color. So that actually made me happy to, to see that in there. Um, okay, so did we, did we have a motion to approve? Did anyone make a motion yet? I'll move to approve. Okay, I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Aye. Yeah, okay, so the motion failed. Thank you. 4-3. Four, three. Four, three. Oh wait, who was, can we do a roll call actually? I think Just so we know who the votes were. So for the ayes, Jen? Aye. Or she's gonna do the roll call. She okay, she. Eva. Trustee Soto? 
Your vote. Yeah. Trustee Acosta. Yeah. Trustee Shocker. No, I want to see the data from the pilot. But we don't, oh. don't have a pilot. We don't have a pilot in place. Oh, okay. We're voting. I thought you said we, this, we are paying 3500 for the pilot. This is for 17000 No. No. The pilot is included in there. We would be able to take off the other part if the pilot didn't mm -hmm. succeed. But we can't do it without this. No. Trustee Holm? Yes. Trustee Dodge? No. Trustee Orozco? Yes. Mm -hmm. President Serpa? Yes, I. The motion failed. I'm Thank sorry. You. Okay, next up is item 9.16 approve the Renaissance High School exterior painting project number 8160. All right, uh, good evening, President Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, my item for you tonight is the approval of a Measure L funded project to paint the exterior buildings of the Re Renaissance High School campus. Oh. And we are requesting approval to award the bid and um, asking for your authorization to enter into, into a construction contract with Fresh Start Painting Company of Millbrae, California with a total base bid of $123,000. $123,900. Are there any speakers? No. Any comments or questions from the board? Okay. Move for a motion. motion to approve. I'll second. second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Anyone abstaining? Motion passes seven all. Thank you very much. You up next again. Still Item 9.17, <laughs> approve the Renaissance High School Campus Paving Project 8160. Okay, good evening again. And um, for this project, we will stay at Renaissance High School. This is also a Measure L funded project. Uh, the general scope of the project is to repave um, the drives that go through the campus and to also relocate an access road that runs right through the middle of the athletic field at Renaissance High School to move that to the side so that it can be a uniform field and be com a complete grass area without a gravel road running through it. Um, and again, for this one, we're requesting your approval of the award of the bid and authorization to enter into a construction contract with Monterey Peninsula Engineering of Marina for the total uh, bid of $381,800. Any speakers? Uh, we have one speaker to this item, Chris Webb. Uh, <laughs> He's being so patient. So I recently met with um, a contractor for this project and uh, one of the things that he said uh, that struck me was why are they waiting until August to start the project? And I had no answer for him, and I hope his information was wrong. Um, knowing this project is a precursor to restoration of our sports field, um, if that is really the start time, I worry that Renaissance students may go another semester at least without a sports field. Uh, the condition of our field and that of our pavement have been issues that WASC has re reported on in the past, and both sports and less formal recreational uh, activities are really a key thing or, or, or they're why we need our sports field so bad. Um, it's really helped in the past to present a positive incentive for students and the loss of the sports field and the after school programming and our progress monitoring system um, have all culminated to make Renaissance less restorative at, and more permissive. Uh, the after school programming at, and the accompanying field were key factors that fit into our old system and they, they're sorely missed. Um, they provided accountability and they acculturated expectations that attendance and academics were important. And in their absence, and the absence of our old program, we've had to rely on more district interventions to address attendance issues and as a result, there's not always the same turnaround, um, even when things come up at site wellness. So I wanna express my deep appreciation for this item 
and the return to form that it portends for Renaissance. And in the interest of ensuring greatest return on investment, I would recommend keeping Renaissance's start and end times as close as legally possible to present times, knowing that continuation schools have students where students are often after school building work experience, and if after school programming runs too late, participation in that programming from staff and students is likely to be diminished. So thank you again for this item. Thank you, Chris. Are there any uh, questions or comments from board members? Okay, Trustee Soto. Is that service road getting paved as well? It will. Oh, it was it the it was one of the um, the alternate bids. So that was uh, alternate alternative number two. Um, the original scope was just to have it be gravel and and kind of the same, replacing what is already there, but just putting it to the um, side. To the side, but um, it the alternative alternative bid did fit within the the. The budget for the project so it will be a paved road that um, runs parallel to san andreas so it's on that side of the athletic field and then around to those outbuildings in the back now is that area going to get paved as well those it is it okay, is in the good. scope to pave the um kind of the square i guess that's yeah, between yeah. the um the bar and the shop and the classroom yeah because it gets rough out there in the winter time yes i'm yeah absolutely i have a question I have a question too um so when do we expect to start working on this so i I do not have an exact date um, in working with planning to prepare for this presentation. This project is scheduled to fall in that summer window of projects that goes from June 6th until um, August 11th. So that was part of the scope that it does need to be completed in that time frame. So not started on August 11th and then moving into the school year still doing this. It needs to be done. So that is part of the conditions for the project. But um, I would have to get back with um, the planning team to find out when the work will be scheduled. But the yes. first step is getting the contract yeah. approved. Right. With the but as far as the having the project completed before the new school year begins, it's uh, that's the goal. Yes, and that's worked into the um, the agreement and the scope of the project. Right. Well, I'm really happy that we're finally moving this along. So I would like to make a motion to approve this item tonight. I'll second. I think just, Trustee um, Shocker has a comment. I just have one comment. Thank you for clarifying the time frame. Yeah. Um, is it possible that as we get updates on this or need change orders that you can include pictures? Um, that went over well last time for Starlight. So if we can just show that with the improvements. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all your hard work in completing this. Yep. Okay, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? We're abstaining. Motion carries seven. All. Oh, thank you. Okay, now moving on to our report and discussion items. This is item 10.1, the 21 22 program update by PVUSD Career and Technical Education. So before we um, continue, I do want to make a motion to extend the meeting till, let's say, midnight just in case. Sounds good. Second. First and second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Motion carries 6 1. Um, can I say one thing though before you start your presentation? Some people might have not been in the room when we made, when we approved our agenda tonight and we had pulled item 9.14 um, by staff recommendation. So um, anyway, so I just wanted to say that in case people were wondering why we didn't um, go over that I agenda item. Okay. Um, good evening, Board President DeSerpa, Vice President Orozco, Board Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, and the PVUSD community. Tonight, I will be presenting an update on the PVUSD CTE program. Is this going to work? you're gonna do it I'm point doing it up, sorry point it oh point it this way and look this way okay <laughs> I can do that thanks sorry for <laughs> it's like patting your head and scratching or something whatever um, oops there it is so tonight um, in preparing this presentation we c we circled around three themes that I wanted to share with you inspiration aspiration and sustainability in our program from um, in 21-22, the people of CTE. In a moment, 
one moment. I just first want to say the fingerprints of PVUSD are all over the CTE program. There isn't a department, a person, a student, a teacher, administration across the board. The whole organization has been incredibly supportive of growing CTE. And tonight, I'm super excited to share with you just a very short video that we put together to show you some of what's going on in our classrooms right now. <laughs> My CTE class has helped me see the world from a whole different perspective and see things more in depth. My CTE class gives me a chance to work on real life hands on projects. I gained the ability to learn new things quickly and be comfortable with taking risks. This class has taught me creative problem solving and to think for myself. It has taught me not to be afraid to fail and to learn from my mistakes. This class has helped me develop a strong voice and take pride in things I create. I'm learning to look at the world as it could be, not as it is on the surface. Thank you. Oops. So the first part of the presentation is around inspiration. Whoops. Oops, there it goes. Um, this is sort of CTE by the numbers. More than 4,700 4, students enrolled, 49 teachers, 72 courses, 26 pathways, 70%, uh, and it's actually 72 because I recalculated it last night. 70% of high school students are in a CTE pathway in our high schools. Um, our um, pathways represent 14 of the 15 California industry sectors, intense high schools and middle schools. 14 of our courses are articulated with Cabrillo College, which is up 75% in the last two years. We are 100% A through G in this school year, which is up 30%, so there is not a CTE class offered by PVUSD that can't go on a UC or a CSU application with a grade of C or better, of course. Um, we have six courses um, that are dual enrolled with Cabrillo College, and that's growing. And because of systems that we're building, we're able to track our students that are completing pathways now. And a completing student is a student who's taken two courses that are sequential in the same pathway. So we'll start to see those numbers improving over time as we have new systems built in our student information system. Vertical alignment, K-12, has been a focus in this last year with a particular lens around coming up through elementary and middle school to high school. Um, this is a, I'm not gonna go through every single item here, but just hitting a couple of those high points around that vertical articulation includes um, middle grade CTE at Aptos Junior will be expanding to an exploring biotech class for eighth grade and video production. Those are both pathways at Aptos High. So students will get a sense of that before they choose their classes as they go into high school. Um, elementary, middle, and um, high school vertical articulation is in place coming up this fall at Hall District, um, Pajaro Middle, and Watsonville High with the Latino Youth Cinema Project and the Exploring the Sustainable Ag Pathway and at Starlight, Cesar Chavez, and PV High, the Latino Youth Cinema Project. And then that dovetails in working closely with Sue Gralty on, on um, the, the kind of coming together, the merging of the Latino Youth Cinema Project with the CTE program as students come up through the high school program. Um, we're still focusing on the high quality elements of CTE, which are national standards 
and there's a, a survey uh, going on right now where I'm visiting elementary schools, meeting with principals to learn about what's happening on their campuses so that um, I can see the really awesome things that are going on because that is the beginning of the um, passions, interests, and talents of our students. And as they are nurtured and grow through the, the younger grades as we prepare to receive them into middle and high school and then on to life, um, getting that information right now, we're going to be able to create an eco map showing all of the connections. Whoops, sorry. How about my hands? All of the connection points and, um, and also the opportunities that we may be able to reveal through that, that work. Our signature pathways are um, growing in their um, features. We have biotech at Aptos High, PV High Programming, Graphic Design at Renaissance, and Sustainable Ag at Watsonville. Three of those four are considered integrated pathways where the students are taking a course subject in combination with a CTE course. For example, at Aptos High, the biotechnology pathway starts with the technology of biology, so freshman bio, through the lens of biotech. Graphic, um, graphic design is an integrated arts class, and sustainable ag also has a three-course pathway where the first class is um, agricultural biology. So it's biology through that lens, and then it's chemistry through that lens as they go through their subject areas. This is a cute little um, photograph of some students that we're seeing something happening in their freshman um, biotech bio class student working in programming at PV High, um, teacher Jason Solis at Renaissance with one of his students, super proud of the work they're doing, and then Erin Laris and her students in the Sustainable Ag Pathway at Watsonville High. The next part of my presentation is aspiration, and I wanted to show you this constellation of partners. Um, CTE is a community of connections. Um, our community partners are what, the, what makes the program come alive. So you can see in brown, we have our established partners, and the blue are our emerging partners. So, you know, longtime partner Digital Nest, the Lagasse Project, very established city of Watsonville with Summer in the City, and other things that we're working on. Um, the MBEP, the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, provides us with insight into the local labor market, which is very important for our program. Project Bike Tech um, in the entrepreneurship pathway at PV High, uh, Latino youth, of course, and then exciting emerging opportunities. I'm having great conversations with the Watsonville Community Hospital around getting our students back in the hospital, visiting on a regular basis um, from both PV High and Watsonville and our patient care pathways. We've been talking with Joby Aviation and U UCSC CIDR, which is their drone initiative around an engineering pathway um, around drone technology, and that Monterey Bay DART is also drone-related um, consortium. The California Home Building Foundation um, was, we mentioned that a few meetings ago. We're partnering with them. They're going to be um, supporting our construction pathways at Aptos and Watsonville with great resources, scholarships, and help for our teachers. And then an, an emerging partnership with Lemelson MIT around um, invention education, project-based learning, very interesting, exciting new developments that are going to show up in the CTE program. Um, just to show you, recently we got notification we received our CTEG grant for the 21-22 school year, they were very delayed. It was, uh, this is a grant that we, that starts in July of last year, but it's it's happening now. And just a quick synopsis so you can see, we applied for 1.1 million, we received a, an award of 933,000, and it's going to fund tiny home projects at both high schools. It's the startup money for the tiny homes and the training for the teachers. It's establishing an engineering pathway at new school and also engineering at our other schools um, to connect to Cabrillo's engineering programs and their two plus two with um, CSUMB and UCSC. So um, engineering is growing in our district, middle grade CTE of course. I'll talk a minute about um, the CTE Works project and just some other, you know, this, this funding supports a whole array of things that um, goes across the whole program. Sustainability funding now and in the future. Just wanted to share with you just a snapshot of the now and the future funding. We have our CTIG grant, which I just shared with you. We have a, 
a former one that we're still um, expending, the new one that's just arrived. Strong workforce we'll be applying for in the fall. The actions of our existing strong workforce grants are still um, occurring. We um, just received our Perkins allocation for this year, and it was up $21,000 from the year prior due to some of the data that we're able to report showing completers and some, some other aspects. That was a favorable um, increase. We have a CTE teach program that's a teacher induction support for new teachers in CTE, middle school implementation, as I mentioned, Hall District, Pajaro Middle, there's funding that is coming from that. Our PVUSD LCAP goal, two action steps in progress. And then in the future, more CTIG, additional rounds of strong workforce, Perkins, and, and then LCAP. Our systems and structures are built with sustainability in mind. And our LCAP goal two really deeply reflects PVUSD's ongoing commitment to the CTE program. We're having an industry advisor recruitment meeting tomorrow evening to build our advisory, our official advisory, which I'll bring a, a list of advisors for the board to consider to the next meeting. Um, we're recruiting out of that event. And then we're, we're doing two projects with Salesforce. And you may be familiar with Salesforce, industry global leader in um, uh, contact management systems that we are using to build out a grant management system because with, between CTE and some of the other grants that are CTE related, we're managing about 60 grants. And it's a lot of um, moving parts. And so one platform to be able to manage, report, make sure we're spending the money the way we said we would, um, doing it with fidelity. Um, that's going to come online July 1. And then our CTE Works platform is a Salesforce platform built for students to be able to connect to the community to, to apply for internships, have opportunities to have work-based learning. So this is just a quick peek at the grant management dashboard that we're working with. I'll bring it back so you can see it for, for reals. Um, then uh, once it's launched after the summer. This is the landing place for the community to be able to see what's going on in our CTE program and for partners to be able to be intrigued and want to know more and to onboard with us. Um, this is what a student will see when they log in. They'll have their Naviance, which you're familiar with is our college and career platform. Students will have taken assessments in Naviance strong interest inventory, Myers-Briggs, some of the things that help people navigate what careers for me. Um, that student is going to get pushed out, tagged opportunities from partners that are posting things because of that assessment data. Um, this is what a partner will see when they log in. And then um, in summary, 4,700 students, 26 pathways, 100% A through G, lots to be excited about. Um, and that truly this program is honoring our students' passions, interests, and talents. And that is my report. Any, I'm delighted to take questions. Do we have any speakers? No. Any questions from the board? Jen Holm. Just a quick comment. It's, yeah. you know, it's like my, um, my oldest graduated from high school six years ago, and, and you know, it's a key, the, the CT, courses that he took then were some of his favorite mm -hmm. and my youngest will start high school next year and i'm so looking forward to the opportunities that he'll have mm -hmm. you know just with what i'm how i've seen ct grow you know since i've been a board member has just been amazing mm -hmm. so thank you yeah you're welcome. thanks it's an honor to work on this it's really it's good work <laughs> yeah so, yeah yes so, you know, it's so exciting, and I know that we've done a lot in the last few years with your leadership, and it just makes me want more. So I have two questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, one is a possible marine biology pathway, and the second one would be an aerospace pathway. Mm -hmm. um, aerospace employs over 2.4 million people, and yeah. it's one of the higher paid sectors. Um, in the United States, so it would be neat to kind of have some ideas moving mm -hmm. forward and some directions we can expand and tap into the existing programs. Absolutely, and we recently explored um, an aerospace grant. Um, that's how we got to be in partnership with Joby, Monterey Bay Dart, UCSC, and that work is continuing. So um, we're laying the groundwork for that and building the relationships for it, and 
thank you for that um, endorsement of that because I think that's a it's a really exciting area. Also, um, in talking with the Watsonville Municipal Airport, kind of planning the bug about drone um, takeoff and landing vertiport. Is, I did I learned a new term um, because Marina has that. But but Watsonville doesn't, so it'd be very exciting to be able to offer courses around that and have that be in our com right in our community as well. So yeah, yeah. Uh, anyone else have a question on this side of the table? I, okay, you do you Maria? Okay. Um, so I think maybe this was on one of the first slides, but can you remind us just so the community can hear how much, what, what's your overall budget for CTE? Um, well, there's um, an underlying significant LCAP investment. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really good question. I'm building a budget right now. One of the things that, that is uh, this year's project is to do a, a four-year plan for CTE with detail in the first 18 months and then the vision kind of heading out four years. I'm also, I'm building a budget along with that that I'm calling Turn the Lights On, which is what does it take to wake the program up every year? Because uh, CTE programs are expensive. And so that's why sustainability is something that I'm really trying to think about in terms of what are the systems and structures that aren't gonna just be money that we spend every year because um, you know, it's the easy way. We're doing some hard work to build things that for efficiency in the future. So, um, can I get back to you? With you that? can absolutely. Okay. Okay. Mostly, I was also just wondering because I, I'm super interested in the platforms with Salesforce. I think that's like yeah. such a good idea because your funders, they want sometimes quarterly reports, biannual reports. Yeah. Uh, monitoring reports I mean so all of those things you can't miss a single one or you are in danger of losing the funding so right. I love that I cannot believe you have 60 grants that's really what I wanted to know is like about how much are you working with in grants yeah and the finance department's incredible um, we're working on this building out this grant management platform together with the support of the district um, because there are so many like each one is somewhat unique so it's not like they all report the same way and in no, the same. and all different times and mm -hmm. all they want all different fit. Yeah, exactly. So it's mm -hmm. um, it's a way to automate portion a portion of that. Well, you can tickle it too, so you yeah. can know mm -hmm. when something is due. So I think I love that idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't wait to show it to you. We're Does Salesforce comp you any of that work? Or? Um, they have an educational. Um, like arm rate. of their corporation uh -huh. and they discount to education like 75 percent so great. the licensing is very affordable you know considering the value of the tool mm -hmm. the development we is a one basically a one-time expense to have it customized to our needs so that it really works for us so that's an expense that we we pay for we get it the way we want it and then ongoingly a little bit of consulting maintenance and licensing each year that just so that's part of the turn the lights on that's great and then do it my other question was do any of your pathways align to anything happening with the adult school are you guys articulating anything with um, Nancy's group uh, we did talk about auto um, that potentially this was before COVID just just before COVID that we talked about um, connecting with potentially with Hartnell because they have a very active successful automotive program, I think they are aligned with Toyota. And um, talking about using having access to that space for another level class, because it's extremely popular. And students love it, and they take level one and two, and then that's it. So if we could go beyond that and then dovetail with adult school and use that that shop, then that's, that's one thing that we have, yeah, that we've talked about, that we need to wake that back up because um, because we can now. Okay. Easier. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a question. Maria has a question um, for you. Oh, pardon so, me. So, um, we now have a virtual academy. Yeah. And so, are those students getting the benefit of something like this? Um, virtual academy. They are. They. Their. The. What they. Their program has some CTE that's built into it. The curriculum or the. Uh, provider that the virtual academy is built on has some CTE um, at this point 
in terms of students being able to take CTE courses from the virtual academy, it has come up a little bit. Um, that's certainly something that we could look at and figure out how to do that. The classes are very um, requested right now, and so uh, you know that's. I think that's. It's certainly something to. I think so. Noodle through. Yeah. Yeah, because I think the goal is to have all the students be able to access this, right? Yeah. Um, so can I add something to that? Um, there are virtual academy students who are enrolled in CTE courses at some of the other high schools. And so okay. the, it does exist right now where they are still enrolled in the other high schools in the CTE courses. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I guess one more, I, I just a comment. It's just nice to see the expansion of partners. Um, at least when I came to the board, hardly anyone really wanted to work with us uh, because they didn't really see our students being successful mm -hmm. or they didn't or they had uh, the idea that our students couldn't succeed. Mm -hmm. And so for us to be able to get to this point where we're seeking out uh, partners and they're responding. Um, I think it's amazing. I think it's a testament for, uh, of the work that we as entire district have done, mm -hmm. you know, from our teachers to cabinet members uh, to board members, um, you know, so, and, and this is really exciting to see and I think is going to be um, uh, very sought out, I think, uh, by surrounding districts. At least that's my hope. <laughs> and that should be the goal. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much to, uh, to you and your team for uh, the amazing work. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks. Can you make a request, sure. President DeSerpa? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it would be <laughs> nice to have a CTE tour, Dr. Rodriguez, and see some of the CTE pathways in the works yeah. um, during the school day. So thank you. That'd be fun. Okay. Okay, thank you for the great report. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Uh, next, we have item 10.2, board training on program governance and family engagement with our migrant and seasonal head start. 2022. This will be delivered by Angelica Renteria. And Irene Herrera No, who's the uh, parent involvement coordinator for Migrant Season Head Start. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Angelica, as you know, Director of Migrant Season Head Start. We appreciate the opportunity to go over the governance training once again. This year, we're planning on spending less time on governance and more time on family engagement. As there are no new members to the board this year, so we're taking this opportunity. I, I believe you all went through this training before, especially President De Serpa, for many, many years. Good evening, President De Serpa members of the board. My name is Irene Herrera No. I'm the Parent Involvement Supervisor with Migrant and Seasonal Head Start. And I'm happy to be here to share a little bit about how we work with parents as partners. So training outcomes, this is an opportunity to remind us of the composition of the governance structure between Migrant and Seasonal Head Start and PVUSD. It is also an opportunity to remind us of the internal systems we have created for a successful and smooth collaboration between governance groups and management. That includes the policy committee, the board of trustees, and district administrators. In addition, we would like to take the opportunity to share with you some of the family engagement opportunities within PVUSD Migrant Head Start that make the program a success. A little bit on the composition of the governance structure. Head Start requires that boards and policy committees work together with district administrators 
on program design, planning, monitoring, and oversight. How do we do this at PBUSD? A few years ago, we created a procedure that has been successfully implemented, I can say. And according to this procedure, one or two members of the board as, act, act as liaisons for the policy committee. It is a privilege to have Trustee Shacker as a liaison for Migrant and Seasonal Head Start. She attends our policy committee meetings regularly and gets appraised of what's going on with the program in detail. She also keeps us informed of community events and activities suitable for our families. It is also a pleasure to have Trustee Daniel Dash Jr. as a liaison for the program. So how do we do this together? How do we work together? It is my, my job as a director to establish a working structure for effective communication with the governing groups. It is also my responsibility as the director to maintain ongoing communication with the funding source and be appraised of changes in requirements, policies, and procedures. Within that structure, I ensure that we meet deadlines for input, for review, for revision, approval, and submission of each one of the elements of the refunding application. As an example, to simplify processes, I developed the calendar on the right. This calendar serves as a guide to ensure all steps and timelines are followed. The goal is to ensure we submit all components of the refunding application in time to secure funding for the following program year. If you look at the screen, there are two calendars. The one on the left represents the timelines established by the funding source, Central California Migrant Head Start, Stanislaus County Office of Education, which is the same agency. That calendar helps us develop our calendar on the right. In addition, we take into consideration meeting dates for both the Board of Trustees and the Policy Committee. And I work with Eva Renteria on that every year. If you look at the calendar in detail on the next slide, highlighted in blue, two task force meetings are scheduled every year for the purpose of providing input opportunities to the governing groups. These task force, these meetings or these two dates are scheduled, uh, carefully scheduled in two different times of the year. The first one before the program starts and the second one in September. To gather input just before the annual refunding application is submitted for review and approval. We just had the first task force meeting a couple of days ago, weeks ago, and we had a rich conversation about family child care home services in the program. You'll notice on that calendar that um, different items come to you for review and approval in different times of the year. Those items go along with our planning calendar and include budgets, program monitoring results, training and technical assistance plan, goals and objectives. As you can see on the calendar, our cycle begins on March 1 and ends at the end of February. We follow the same cycle every single year. It's a little hard for the district because we have a different funding year and Colleen suffers a lot with us because we have accounting differences, but um, we work together really well on that. Also, on the board packet, I included a copy of the program governance reference book, book that gives you more detail about governance. So this is governance in a nutshell. And this is what I have for you tonight. So I can give you an opportunity to listen to Irene and learn more about family engagement. And before I move to family engagement, I would like to know if you have any questions on this structure.
before you move on to engagement is that what you said family engagement um i don't i think we're going to save questions for the end yes that's fine if that's okay yes. if everybody Perfect. could write down their question So family engagement is an essential component of Head Start. Tonight, we would like to discuss the Head Start approach to family engagement and some examples of what this looks like in our program, especially as it relates to school readiness. As you can see on the slide, there are four approaches that we take, and I'm gonna briefly review each one of them. But please, uh, 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 look at the center uh, image. I will start there. Um, the district's focus of serving the whole child, the whole family, and the whole community is what Head Start is all about. It's supporting children and families in a comprehensive way. And we do this by providing early learning and development services, dental and health screening, healthy meals, and services to support family well-being. The focus has been, this focus has been the foundation of Head Start since the very beginning. That was 57 years ago. So number one, communication and relationship building. Our first and most important approach to effective family engagement is building trusting relationships with families. In order to build those trusting relationships, we emphasize the role of the parent as the first and most important teacher. And we recognize that each family has strengths for supporting, supporting their children. In addition to this, each family's culture and language is honored. As an example of this, we currently have a trilingual staff member on board. She speaks English, Spanish, and Mixteco Bajo to support our indigenous population. You see, in Myron and Seasonal Head Start, each and every staff member has a role to play in supporting family engagement. I'm gonna move on to the second uh, focus area. As participants of the Migrant and Seasonal Head Start program, families receive individualized services. Each participant is uh, paired up with a family services advocate. And this person conducts a home visit to get to know the family and to complete a family needs and strengths assessment. And any immediate needs that are identified are prioritized and they're addressed either through internal or external referrals. Family advocates also collaborate with the families to help them identify any interests, needs, or aspirations that they might have in order to support them to create family goals. In the, in the education component, teachers and family child care home providers meet with the families to get to know the children and to learn about their individual needs so that they can support them in their transition to the program. They also plan individualized activities for the children based on screening and assessment results. And this includes children with disabilities. Through the experience of participating in individualized services, our parents become learners. Our third approach is to offer ongoing learning opportunities for parents. The program offers many of those learning opportunities such as participating in special topic workshops where they can learn about car seat safety or they can learn other, uh, other things that can help them support their family. They can also become involved in one of 10 parent committees. The parent committees are a key approach to supporting ongoing learning for families. First, in these parent committees, there's a space where parents can develop leadership skills. Parent leaders are elected for each committee and they take on specific roles. Second, families receive program updates and announcements directly from program staff and from teaching staff. Third, parent committees provide the space where educational presentations can be delivered on a variety of topics. 
First, uh, families and staff collaborate in a selection process. And this is a, a lengthy process that takes into account our program's goals and objectives. Um, and this couldn't be achieved if we didn't have collaborations in the community. Over the years, the program has developed partnerships. And it's with various agencies, but to name a few, Salud Para La Gente has been a strong collaborator, the City of Watsonville, uh, Community Bridges, and most recently, the Pajaro uh, Valley Health Trust. So the last approach here is empowering families to advocate for their own needs. Besides empowering families and the parent committees, uh, we have a parent leadership group. This is the policy committee. And this is a group of 15 parents, and they have a say in how the program is run. Their role is to ensure that the program meets the needs of all families. For example, the policy committee gives input, reviews, and approves each element of the refunding application that Angelica just reviewed for you. This includes the days, months, and hours of operation. In addition, the policy committee uh, parents have the opportunity to serve in the policy council, and this is a regional parent leadership group. At times, this group is invited to represent the grantee agency, Central California. I think our mic is, yeah, we lost the mic. One second. We want the people who are watching on TV to be able to hear what you say, so just one second. Sorry about that. So as I was saying, parents have the opportunity to participate in the regional parent leadership group, the Policy Council. And at times, they're able to go to national conferences and policy forums in Washington, D.C., where they have the opportunity to advocate directly to senators and representatives. And if you look at, at the slide here, we, this is a picture of our former Policy Committee president. He's being interviewed there. And he uh, participated in a video for the Council for a Strong America. And he was advocating for more uh, quality early child care programs, especially in rural areas. So we can move to the next slide. So here, um, these are different ways in which families can become engaged to support their families, uh, their child's uh, ongoing learning and development. But today, we want to focus on uh, our parenting curriculum and our off-season instructional program, so number three and number seven there. So Ready Rosie uh, is a research-based education tool that helps families support their own learning as well as their child's learning. And we began using this curriculum four years ago. And here's how it works. Families receive a weekly playlist, and in that playlist, there's three to four videos. Um, and they receive them either, either by text message or by email. Each video contains real families. Uh, as you can see there, they're modeling um, games and communication, conversations in different areas. And the areas are listed there, language and literacy, math, social, emotional learning, health, and well-being. So families watch those videos, they do the activities with their child, and then they share their experiences, their comments with us through the Ready Rosie platform, 
and staff can respond to those comments. And it's really uh, great to see those comments come in because that gives us an opportunity to encourage them or um, at times uh, they have difficulties with th those um, activities and we're able to give them strategies on uh, how to simplify those activities or at times even how to make them a little bit more challenging for them. Um, so the last thing I want to say is that um, in 2021, we were able to have 502 families connected and participating in our uh, parenting curriculum. And that represents 89% of our families. Um, and so we're happy with, with uh, Ready Rosie. And every year, we're really looking at how we can uh, improve our implementation. And so we're working on that at this time. Thank you. Magdalene and Sison has started a new project last winter. That project originated from the need to continue supporting the ongoing learning of children while the program was closed. As you know, we opened the main season May through October. We don't have funding to continue, but we basically meet the needs of the families working in the fields. In a discussion with the early learning team and in an effort to standardize assessment timelines, data analysis, and in wanting to be more intentional on opportunities for children's learning and school readiness, we created the off-season instructional program. For this project, we invited all four-year-olds, 146 of them, and their families in November to continue with us through March when the program was closed. Through this project, we offered informational sessions and monthly check-in meetings for parents so they could learn about the purpose of the project and how to support their children by utilizing available resources included in the monthly educational packets, the applications and programs on the iPads, and how to engage at home without the direct support of the teacher. We had, out of the 146 we invited, we had 138 children participating. 95% of them received an iPad. Those iPads have specific applications uploaded, including Ready Rosie, Parenting Curriculum, Footsteps to Brilliance, our literacy program, bilingual songs and videos that support English language development, alphabet knowledge, phonological awareness, and math concepts. Thanks to the technology department for the support. As you can see on the chart, 101 families attended one or more monthly educational check-in meetings from December to March. We distributed 430 educational learning home packets to families to support children's learning at home. And we have a sample of the packet with us, if you wanna see it. In addition, we collected 138 family activity calendars those calendars include simple 15-minute activities for each day. Those activities are carefully selected to support school readiness goals. And for each activity the families complete with their children, we get credit. We collect, collect in-kind donations. In 2021, we collected $451,000 from these calendars. This is just an example on how easily families can get engaged in activities with their children and spend quality time together. And at the same time, they help us meet our non-federal share requirement. Some of the successes, this slide speaks for itself. We have on the left, Senora Elvira Luna Rodriguez picking up her monthly educational learning packet in the winter. In the middle, we have our, our top student reader in the pre-K TK category, Ruby Vega Ortiz for Footsteps to Brilliance. She read 30,675 words. And then to the right, we have our top Ready Rosie participant, a parent, Senora Zenaida Jimenez. She was also recognized for being the top Radio Rossi participant in, two, in 2021. 
these pictures alone represent the high quality early education programs PBUSD offers to children and families. And throughout the years and experience, we have learned that if we equip families to advocate for themselves and to support their children and their education, we're building a better future together. Thank you for your support. What a great Question. presentation. Do we have any speakers to this one? We have no speakers. Okay, and any comments or questions from our board? I just wanna make a comment if I may. You may comment and thank you for being um, a liaison to this program. It's wonderful. Program. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Um, it's a great program. I just wanted, um, Eva, if, or Angelica, sorry. <laughs> If you can tell us how many current um, family homes we have serving our children. In 2021, we contracted with 51 family shelter homes. That's in addition to the child development contracts. Mm -hmm. Serving 437 children during the regular season and then 70 children in the winter session. Okay, and how many homes are we still short? So we've lost providers. We've lost providers through the winter to other programs that contract with the providers um, year round. And um, we lost about 57 slots. We continue our recruitment activities. Uh, we were just speaking to La Bamba yesterday about uh, helping us with recruitment. Um, and then we had a wonderful discussion last week about different strategies on recruitment. Uh, we're gonna go to, uh, to the farmers markets and, and uh, Alicia just gave, gave me the access to sign up to, to do different activities in the community so we can continue recruitment. We also have a child development advisory um, credentialing program in-house to support providers that meet Head Start requirements so they can contract with us. And I believe we have about eight participants in that Child Development Advisory Credential Program. And how many children are we looking at coming um, into this season? Because we'll be starting in May. So you know how, about how many children we have registered? We are funded for 752 children and um, we serve about 80% um, of the children in the regular season and the rest of the children in the winter session, depending on, on how many slots we get uh, between now and May in family childcare homes, that will depend how many children um, stay for the winter program. Okay, and with the site at Freedom being remodeled, how is that going to impact um, the program? The remodeling of the Freedom site is going to impact the program with a loss of uh, 40 slots, 40 preschool slots, but we're looking at additional family childcare home slots so we can get additional spaces for those children in the meantime. Thank you very much for a great report. Thank you. I have a comment and a couple questions. Trustee Roscoe. Thank you. Um, you know, you said something uh, really important, Angelica, and I totally agree with you. It's not just about providing our parents with resources and tools is really about empowering the entire family to advocate on their behalf. Um, and so I think you've done a phenomenal work in that regard. I know when I served in the committee years back, um, I was able to get a glimpse of that uh, with the parents sitting at the table. Um, so their leadership and just how spoken they were and how informed um, they were uh, in advocating for their needs was really neat to see. Um, so uh, you did mention internal and external resources. Um, how does the follow through look uh, for that? So after uh, you identify a need, mm -hmm. you provide an external referral to a family, is there a follow through after that? Yes. So we have family services advocates, we have 11 of them. Okay. 
And those families support the families, um, make a connection with the families to see what their needs are. So the first thing we do during registration is we do a survey. And then from the survey, we start collecting information about how we can support them. In, 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 including in, in, included in that survey, we do a language survey. So we know exactly how many families uh, with different languages we have in the program. We've been collecting data on the indigenous population since 2003. And uh, in 2003, we had 3% of the families from indigenous population. Right now, we have 45%. So that's why we decided yeah. to create that position, to open that position, um, to support the families. Mm -hmm. so, so when we started connecting with the family, we started learning about their needs. Then we do follow other steps to be able to support them, support them in their needs. And we have collaborations with different community agencies. Um, we have a collaboration with Pajaro Valley Prevention Services. and. Um, when we identify a child uh, with behavioral needs, we do the referral. We, of course, we, we um, do internal curriculum practices and strategies before we do the referral. But as we get to know the child, uh, we learn about specific needs. And we also have a formal MOU with CELPA mm -hmm. and a formal MOU with San Andres Regional. Okay. Thank you for that. So it's, it's really important too that it's very much data driven, right? So any move that you make, it's because you have collected that data through an initial assessment and throughout your observations. Okay. Um, so thank you for that because I think that's uh, fundamental. That's how you identify uh, the needs of each family uh, and are able to provide those resources that address that specific need. Um, so thank you for this presentation. It was excellent. I enjoyed it. And I, I think I walked away with even a better uh, picture of the tremendous amount of work that you and your team do. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the board? Good job and nice presentation. This is your first time presenting here? You did great. You did great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Okay, now we have, we're almost to the end of our meeting, everybody. Next we have a consent agenda, and I would like to just call out some donations um, on behalf of our district and for the um, Amara Lagasse kitchen. We have three new donations, if I can find them to report out on and with with great, great gratitude um, to the S. Martinelli and Company for their $1,500 donation, to A&I Transport Incorporated for their $11,000 donation, and to Ms. Giselle Ariano for a $500 donation. Every dollar counts and we so appreciate you supporting the efforts of our district to um, complete our special kitchen and garden. So thank you, that's a total of $13,000. So we are on item 11.1, .1. I'm sorry, 11, it's a consent agenda. I'm looking for a motion to approve. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously, thank you. Um, now we are going to move to item 14.1, action and report on closed session. Sure. Thank you. So under item 2.1, the board approved a full expulsion for the remainder of the school year and the 22-23 fall semester for student number 21-22013 with a 601 vote. Under that same item, the board approved the district administration recommendation for a full expulsion for the remainder of the school year and the 22-23 fall semester for student number 21-22012. Under that same item, uh, the board approved the district recommendation for a full expulsion for a full year, full calendar year starting the first day of suspension 
for student number 2122014. And lastly, under that same item, um, the board approved the district recommendation, the district administration recommendation for a full expulsion for a full calendar year starting the first day of suspension for student number 2122015. Under item uh, 2.2, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration on March 23rd, 2022 with 33 and 39 additional action items. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries, thank you very much. Okay. So um, under we, item. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Under item 2.3, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration on March 23rd, 2022, with 19 and 6 additional action items. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries unanimously. And that's all I have for closed session. Okay, thank you. Um, now we're on item 15.1. This is upcoming board meetings. On April 20th, we have a very special board meeting. It will be virtual and it will be um, to recognize um, student, achieve, student achievement. Students yeah. of the year. St oh, sorry, students of the year. So um, I'm guessing a link will be posted and we'll all be able to participate. And then um, we'll be back here in the board meeting. Our next general board meeting will be on April 27th. And have a great and uh, fun, healthy spring break, everybody. And thank you for coming tonight.